And it's going to reset right now. Uh huh. <laughs> Hi, friends. My name's Jose Enrico, which is Mexican for Jose Eric. And this is Rachel Alyssa Ah, which is Mexican for Rachel F. Alyssa. Mm-hmm. And today we're live streaming on the YouTube channel called Talking with Famous People. The title of which, this episode of which is Making People Mad. And uh, I think it's an interesting topic because I've devoted most of the last seven years of my life to doing field work in the study of making people mad. Uh, I've made a lot of people mad. (laughs) And sometimes it shocked me, like, wait, you're mad at me? Sometimes it was no surprise at all. Uh, sometimes I felt bad afterwards. Sometimes I didn't feel bad at all. Uh, so my current little hypothesis that I'm running by everybody, and I decided to name this stream making people mad rather than the better title that I was going to name it, which is, am I Fommel Hawks Fiona Apple? Oh, because I just thought, well, I want to talk about things in a much broader sense than that. And that's the specific example I have for my hypothesis. So I went with the title, Making People Mad, which I also think is a good title. (coughs) My my current theory is this. If you want to enrage somebody, you, uh, you negate or otherwise fail to uphold the absolute value of their fifth slot function. Of, of your fifth slot function with your seventh slot function. So in other words, if somebody violates NI with FI, that's how to piss me off. Um, I, I, and Fiona Apple is a perfect example of that. So Fiona Apple's song, she was, um, I guess you'd say, spitting in the face of the absolute value of introverted intuition, intuition. And her reasoning, which was clearly articulated in her lyrics in general, is FI. It's uh, people should do what's authentic to them, regardless of what's true. And and that made me very angry. So, does she give you supervisor vibes? I mean, I, it's impossible for me to tell because I'm not having a conversation with her. Whether or not she's an INFP or an ENFP is, in my mind, an open question. She's one of the two, obviously. Regardless, uh, well, let's just fall. Here's the thing. You don't expect other people to um, uphold adequately on your dominant function in general because you expect yourself to fill that role. So it's the, the thing is, it typically is a fifth slot function because um, in order for you to fulfill that role, people need to uphold a basic level of of equivalency in terms of valuing your fifth slot function. <coughs> and in other words, Legends Fall, what really bothers you, what pisses you off, uh, Legends Fall, is not um, when people violate SE for FI sake, but for SI failings. If you make plans for somebody and they forget all about it and they're they're not keeping track of shit and they uh, they are not conscientious enough to follow through on the things they need to do to do the shit that you want to do, that's gonna really piss you off. Then then that's that's failing as uh, failing to uphold the value of or failing to failing to use SI correctly to to um, that would allow you to, to validate it on your SE. When somebody uses failing to use SI correctly because of FI reasons, then that's going to be the worst case scenario. And that's the perfect storm of anger. Not only does somebody fail to uphold your fifth slot value, but they fail to do it for the worst possible reason. That is to say, they use your, your thinnest absolute value as an instrumentality to do evil. And here, so in other words, they use something that you see as pure and good and simple in a complicated way that you, you don't think it should be used at all. It just should be experienced or whatever. 
They use that thing in a complicated way to violate what you think is ultimately the core purpose of the, the core universal value to be upheld. For, for an SE DOM, that core universal value to be upheld is that um, people have and own their own experiences and that a person comprises the totality of their experiences. Um, so if when people totally fail to uphold that, that ideal, which is to say they um, are continually rejecting a, uh, a self comprising stories of experiences and, um, and, and that upholds the idea that one should have SI pleasurable experiences as well, which is to say for SE downs, it's like sex and alcohol and stuff mostly. And, um, but to fail to do that because you don't, know, because of some selfish thing, because you're not being a team player, that's what's going to piss you off. SE obligates SI. So it makes sense that if they fail to be SI obligated by my SE for FI reasons, they control right I there. see you, juicer. Thanks, darling. You're welcome. I love it when you get a juicer. I don't think it's okay to impose my principles on others, just don't insist I can't uphold my own principles. Sure, right. And, and the thing is, uh, I'm not insisting, and that, that's the issue with the Fiona Apple song, right? In no way, shape, or form am I insisting, this, this but probably another element to it, am I insisting that she should have to write the song that I'm saying, you know? It's, was, it just makes me mad because, in my mind, she doesn't have to, and she's choosing to. Oh, you know, honestly, that moment when we listened to that famous Apple song, and I intuitively was, into, like, introverting that same thing, same thing that you said. The way that you were like, the song should go, man, 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 after, and uh -huh. I was, I was thinking the same thing. It was so difficult for me because here's Delilah who showed us the song and like loves the song and we're like taking it apart. So it was right, like, well, a what, what happened was I seized the frame and said, first, let me take your FE toolbox and throw it in the trash, Rachel. Now let's talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's... Oh, yeah. I think you might have no, I didn't. The juicer. Mm -hmm. See, yeah, if yeah. there wasn't this sort of nose hair plucking from this part of my nose, I would have a third eyebrow that went like this. It would be a nose brow. <laughs> the dad gets them too. Really? Yep. Um, so, uh, I think that that's kind of a part of it too, Valerie, is that you know the person doesn't have to do it the way you want it to be done, but you think the way they're doing it is fundamentally just a terrible choice. In other words, you, you the person gets no credit for from you for um, for making a mistake. You can't imagine they're not aware that they're choosing that, and so that's what's particularly annoying about it. It's uh, it's totally within their rights to do it that way, but, and you don't think that they, it's not like you go, well, they can't help themselves. You deny them that, and you just think, why are you choosing to do this in such a stupid way? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I actually, I'm, I, I was thinking about when I get mad, like what makes me mad, and it's when I'm finally any -ing, and people don't believe me. Like, if I'm, like, telling the truth, I'm, like, if I'm using my NE, which I usually ignore, and I'm finally doing it, and someone's, like, no, you don't really mean that. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I do! Just because I, like, hold back my opinion sometimes doesn't mean that I don't, like, actually have feelings on the inside. People are cray. <laughs> well, this is something that Rachel and I were sort of, we didn't talk about directly, but is relevant, is... Uh, I can totally understand. I feel like I totally know the situation she was in prior in terms of the 
like the impossible place that she was in where the way that, that the, the bad guys would always turn any truth telling against her. It yeah. was structured to do that. Mm -hmm. So anytime that she's, that she's getting upset or uh, irritated at the fact that these purported mental health professionals and her, uh, her family are colluding to steal from her self-determination, basically. Yeah. In other words, because you're not entirely independently self-determinant financially, we're going yes. to use that. And because you have had a, a, a mental health problem, we're going to use those things to, to further remo remove self-determination from you rather than, than, caring about you as a human being yeah. really. Um, and then every, she, you know, she'd sit there and try to go along with this bullshit in the, in the mental health facility where they had to go to these group meetings and shit that was just insane. Um, she, they had her, she, she tried to go along with it for a while and then she'd get irritated and she'd be like, you know what? This is the truth. Blah, blah, blah. And everyone, and you know, the therapist would write down, Mm, she's really got a chip on her shoulder and she's, she's very, very bitter, very has, she, she's got very reactive emotions and, uh, blah, 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 you know, it's, uh, yeah. it infuriates me to think about it. It infuriates me to think about these, these people who are wrong and trying to impose their wrong frame on Rachel and every bit of resistance to that wrong frame that she gives, they perceive as further upholding their wrong frame under their wrong frame yeah and so um of course the beautiful thing is uh at least half of the people involved are still in her life namely her family and you know they had their their 10 years at bat or whatever yeah but for the rest of the whole for the rest of rachel's life mm -hmm. and the rest of the family's life um they really have to sort of walk on eggshells. This like, is these are facts. They can't say a goddamn thing because all Rachel has to say is, uh, "You had ten years to help me with my mental health problem, and spent it primarily torturing me, and I was right the whole time, wasn't I? Everything you were saying was complete fucking bullshit, and you ignored me. In fact." You tried to punish me into agreeing with you, even though it turned out you were 100% wrong. Yeah. What do you have to say for yourself? Because it, she's won the argument so decisively now. Right. And I'm not afraid to say, I'm not, I'm not above saying that to people too. If they, so they would be, I mean, that's some balls to come up to me and say anything about anything that they <laughs> used to argue about. Oh yeah. They, yeah. That's like a come at me, bro. And uh, <laughs> I don't really think anyone in my family wants to do that. Well, you know, they, they're they not as, I guess you could say, they're not as intuitive as we are. Yeah. But, um, even not. they, even they can, uh, can tell that, um, it's not a good I idea to antagonize that giant with massive spiky clubs. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I must, uh, maybe I need to wipe off wipe my man seed from your mom's face. <laughs> yeah, there, that was the problem. It was my man seed all over your mom's face. <laughs> Uh, no need for people to get all mad. Let's bottle up our feelings like good, responsible people do. <laughs> That's a good point, Thomas. The thing is, I, is it? No, it's not. That's <laughs> <laughs> a joke. I know. Uh, turn this down, this light down a little bit. Seems a little shiny. There. That. Whoa. That's a little bit better, I think. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> So if, in fact, there is the case that my hypothesis is correct, let's say you had an ISTJ and you wanted to make them angry. Well, what you would do is uh, fail to uphold SE for um, FE reasons. You know, in other words, I know I said we were going to do that, but uh, then Joe said uh, that would be embarrassing, and so I decided not to go or something. That That would be... 
You know, so and so some something was failed to be completed because some person felt some person was rude or something. That that I guess would would uh, would be an example of that. It, it's interesting. Um, or yeah, someone telling them that they're being rude. Well, no, like an ISTJ is. Um, working on something let's say with somebody like you know he's currently working on a project with us and we'll probably work on it again tomorrow uh, oh yeah that's the plan but um <laughs> if i were to fail to follow through on that because uh say um i go wait you know what one of my friends in the typology community they said that they wanted to do this basically this channel and that they had the idea first and you know it's like i really don't want to piss them off because you know they're pretty they're they really like they kind of judge they're kind of judgy and I'm, they're gonna shame me i guess like that if i were to say oh we can't do this project anymore because of my i guess you'd say like effie uh if he harm avoidance, then that would probably piss him off a lot. I found it interesting when Cameron said that um, Alexa pisses him off. Like, he really seemed to be pissed off while talking about um, Alexa and that he and Kara got into, like, a tiff before he came over. And, and Alexa... It's because, probably, it sounds like it's because Kara was using her six-slot FE with Alexa. Right? Yeah. <laughs> demonstrative Effie. Like, don't yell at Alexa. That's literally what actually she said. She said, don't yell at Alexa. And then he, you know, was like, not happy about that. So, uh. Um, Tiny Man 66, that's actually Ribbit, the frogs say, R I B B E T. But um, it's also the case that the Rebay Academy mascot was the Fighting Frogs. So, Obviously, people the, the academy is aware of the fact that and it still is different frogs. The academy is aware of the fact that their name makes people say "ribbit," <laughs> uh, but it's pronounced "rebe," just like ballet has a T at the end of it, but it's, the sound at the end of it is "a." So too with "rebe." Yes. And their mascot is the fighting frogs, right? Go. Ooh. Oh, did you kiss? It hits you? Oh, that was a super big kiss. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, well, it started by a French dude. His name, like, uh, I think, you know, it was seriously something like Jean Jacques Robet. It's like a very French. It's a very oh. French name. He was a, he was from France, and his vision for the school was he wanted to start what was basically like a uh, a French version of an English boarding school or something. Anyway, the culture of the school for before I got there, he was in charge of it for a while, a while, and then he died in the eighties. Of uh, age, fairly young, and um, and then the school kind of continued on with this bohemian spirit for quite a while. It was a uh, a very successful school. Like they had a big waiting list, they had a lot of people there. It's like all the all the sort of Highland Park uh, rich bohemian types, like your your industry people. And your Eagle Rock, rich bohemian types, also generally industry people. Industry people, when you say that in L.A., you mean uh, they're in entertainment industry people. Anyway, they, they would send their kids there. And uh, it, was, it was bursting at the seams with student population. But, of course, uh, <clears throat> what ended up happening is that sort of bohemian French cultural aspect of it uh, 
what happened before I got there was there was this huge scandal and it was like lots of staff were having lots of uh, inappropriate relationships with students and it was mm-hmm. it was a um, big it, the whole place blew up basically and then the new owner came in and cleaned, cleaned house and then hired a bunch of people. I was one of those people that got hired in the post-cleaning house period. See, that can happen with office too. Um, I really like what Legends Ball had to say about SI and SD. Um. My fourth and eighth slots, like, it go, it goes back and forth like a fucking, like, it, it's like a eight symbol. If it goes back, like, sometimes I'll be really good with my SI, and then I'll be bad with my SE, and then my SE will be affected by my SI. It's like, and then these are like, oh. I want to do the INFJ here and talk about how that applies to you for a second because it's like that's what mercy was doing for te reasons they were failing to uphold an extroverted intuition value which is hey why don't we try a different approach (laughs) you know (laughs) oh this this isn't working uh and then um they thought that it was just me right and they're telling rachel the whole time that she needs to be more in accordance with their TE protocols that were unlinked to any actual, yeah. they were unlinked to her personally, and they were also unlinked to universal truths. Yeah. So there's no indication whatsoever that people with bipolar mania have bipolar mania because they smoke pot. Yeah, it was really frustrating to me. I was there and I told them every single time when it would really come down to like, like the nitty gritty, I was like, we can go back into my file and you can see that when I was in North Carolina, they didn't say anything about weed. They wanted my mental health figured out, but they did not. There was nothing in the documents that said I had to be treated for any kind of substances, but yet they, that's what they were treating me for. So she was I'm, being treated for cannabis addiction. Yeah. She had, in other words, they had linked her mental health to, to the fact that she wouldn't stop smoking weed. And that, that the big problem was, if she just stopped smoking weed, her mental health would be fine in some reg- in some sense. Yeah. And that, but of course, she needed a lot of group therapy to be okay. As you can see, Rachel needs absolutely no group therapy to be okay. <laughs> I was seen as like rebellious in in rebellious, therapy. difficult, <laughs> uh, bitter, yes. chip on the shoulder, chip on the shoulder. Um, like- yeah, you know. Like can't control her emotions, prone to outbursts, impulsive. Blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. those were all things that they would look out for because that means that either See, I'm she's going manic, off the rails again. Yeah, yeah, going off the rails again. Yeah, they got this built-in protocol of excuse making that to allow themselves mm-hmm. to never be held accountable for anything. So, um, but the glorious reality of it is, it all fucking came crashing down mm-hmm. because. What happened is this beautiful world, like the universe provided Mm -hmm. this this thing in which there was a great injustice being done over a long period of time. And then there's only one incredibly long shot way that she can win. (laughs) And that's to somehow arrive at the the life that she says would be better for her, in other words, to actually try it her way and compare that to. So her way would be, would have been, if articulated beforehand, find the right medication for me, please, because I'm not, this, this these sleeping pills that are OTL and not sleeping pills are not making me sleep. Um, so that would have been one of her positions prior. They just give her more of them. You know, yeah. uh, just more trazodone. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing would have been, and um, the one thing that really helps me feel like I have a reward in life, something to look forward to, 
something that I I can indulge in as everybody needs, you you keep telling me is the problem, not not part of the solution, but I know otherwise, and you aren't positioned to know better than I about this point, um, and yet you continue to insist it. But of course, she's an INFJ, not an ENTP. So, you know, over time, I've come to understand what she knew, and I can explain it very well. But what she knew was not she did not know what she knew the way I come to know what she knew right. from an argumentational perspective. Right. She knew what she knew from an experiential any. perspective. And she, yeah, it's like, she's not going to, they had her completely uh, triangulated into one spot. Yes. And the only way that she was going to get out of that, the only way she was going to win the argument is for shit to play out just as it has. In other words, for her to come here, continue on that medication regimen, it not work, She'd go totally crazy, go back to New York, have the same problem again, come back here, and we hire a psychiatrist finally, and it solves the problem like that. Yeah. And once the problem's solved, then the relevancy of the marijuana issue becomes indisputable. Yeah. It's totally irrelevant. She smokes shit tons of weed all the time. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that when the medication for mental illness is correct, she it has no impact on her mental health at all. So it's like the idea that um, that that any anybody from that camp could argue anything that they were doing or saying at the time was correct is can been completely falsified. But the only way that you can falsify it is if you imagine a scenario where somehow Rachel went from that life where she was being completely controlled into a different life where she was being completely enabled to be herself as best as, as best as the person yes. who that could enable it, you know? The healthiest I've been, like, since I've like, been a kid, which is ridiculous. Um, but I'm, you know, eternally grateful, like, every day. Um, I don't want to get choked up and cry. Uh, Grogu says, people have so much prejudice against weed, I don't get it. I get, there really is... My brother is 100% prejudiced against me. When I came home from, or when I was going through a manic phase, um, and, like, came home from North Carolina, and was living at home again, he was like, he was like, I don't care, he, he's my younger brother, mind you, he's, scolding me for being a stoner and like saying that he doesn't want to like even associate with me because I smoke weed. Like I was like, um, first of all, like, where do you come off? What do you, where do you get off? Like, um, Rachel, what do you think about Cameron and his use of TE? Um, it's interesting. He, it sounds like he feels like he's not good at his TE, but he's really good at it. Um, That's weird that you think he'd feel like that. I don't think he th feels that way. About no, I don't. No. No, but you said you think he he has deaths about his own TE, but I don't think he has oh. deaths about his own TE. But I think it's under, I think it's interesting that you think he does oh. because you're you, it's indicative of TE polar. He has <laughs> yeah. doubts about Effie, but uh, <laughs> yeah. See, I, I can't really answer that question. I guess I don't know. Like. Um, it, is it an ESTJ issue? People they just want to control access to it just because it's an ESTJ issue that they want to interface everything. So in other words, uh, if you want to interface everything, then your thing is, well, we just need to come up with the right ongoing processes to sustain uh, in order to go from here to there. Rachel, right now the problems manifest like this. In other words, when you are when you actually are crazy, you are uh, very fighty. So yes. that means every time you disagree with me, you must be crazy. Right. Right? Neat trick there, huh? Even when Rachel was actually going through a, a psychotic episode, I still tried to do my best to um, listen to what she was saying and adhere to her wishes, you know, and recognize that that having a a period of time in which one has basically an, an illness of identity uh, yeah. is does not need to be does not need to be 
made worse by a further denial of their their agency, self-determination, and whatever. You know, you want to try to maximize that in that time. You don't want to try to minimize it because you're going to have to. You're going to have to uh, in, in encroach upon it somewhat. And so you want to try to do that as little as possible, not take advantage of the fact that now I can now I can take control of the reins and I'll do a much better job than, right. than she's doing herself because she's obviously not doing it right. But I'm in bipolar and my way that I'm familiar with is the right way. That's the best guy because he's the guy I've been going to for years now. Yeah. My mom was like basically friends with my psychiatrist too. And many conversations about me like behind my back and I don't know. Oh, yeah, at some point, if I don't, if they don't give me any opportunity. I may have to say something like, "So you must be pretty furious at Mercy, huh?" <laughs> I get fake bills from them now. I would say that to mom. What the hell would she do? You know, that'd be crazy. Oh, oh my god! You must be furious with oh. a terrible job Mercy General did, huh? Oh my god! I don't even know. I don't know how my mom would react. <laughs> my mom is not used to um, people standing up to her. If uh, you catch my... Like, <laughs> well, her like, attitude has dramatically changed yeah. since it was from the beginning oh with my me, God. right? She she's, does not want to cross swords with me at all no, anymore. she doesn't. She used she to want to cross swords with me. Yeah. But, yeah, she's learned her lesson, I think. Um... Shit bus. Shit bus indeed. Shit bus to you too, sir. Shit bus indeed. Okay, so Kristen Adcox says, says type me here. You are an ESFP. <laughs> pretending to be someone named Kristen. Weed is not for everyone. I was I never I always said that. <clears throat> but I I would say like at these group meetings that it's like does the smoke also cause problems? Um, oh, that's at Scott Steiner. I don't think for me, if that question were asked for me, does smoking weed both have good and bad effects? I would say uh, the only bad is that it costs money. I'm not sure what uh, which individual you speak of when you say the guy who claims he was an INFJ and there was a back and forth between us. So uh, can you tell me which night it was on or what the video was called or something? Everyone's an INFJ. What type is shit bus? Well, um... You know, one of the shit bussy variety, I suppose. My mom is uh, an ESTJ, but she's like, her Enneagram is different. So she has a different affect than um, other ESTJs. Like, I mean, it is things, Scott Steiner. Of course. If there were actually a mechanism of that sort in which you saw heavy long-term cannabis use leading to short-term memory problems later in life, then you would expect probably that the, the mechanism, in other words, if in fact there's a causal link between them, that depending on the heaviness of the use, you'd see, you, you definitely, it wouldn't be like this, right? It would be like this. But that's actually not the case. So, uh, I mean, put it this way, Scott Steiner. If marijuana has diminished me intellectually at all, um, I mean, I must have been pretty smart to begin with, right? I, I don't mean to, to say I'm particularly genius or anything. I'm just saying... There's no, there's absolutely no sign that my constant weed smoking is causing me to be 
at all intellectually weakened. That includes short-term memory stuff. Now, granted, as an extroverted intuitor, I naturally have short-term memory problems. And as an intuitive, I naturally have short-term memory problems. And when I'm high, it may maximize that. So in other words, it's like, um, I may I may be more prone slightly to getting off topic and forgetting to go back to the original topic when I'm super high, maybe. But my experience is that's much more likely to happen when I'm on amphetamines. So in other words, there's a constant balance needing to be done here in me between um, saying enough, saying too much, and not completing my thought, right? Those are the three states of being. And when I'm, since I'm constantly communicating, I need to uh, I need to pay attention to that. Now, where you say here that uh, pot causes problems with SI, messes with SI, I agree that marijuana links to my SI in the sense that I'm very habituated to it, almost as a muscle memory thing. I'm very accustomed to periodically smoking weed. Um, so, if I look to the past for what to expect, I should expect myself to smoke weed, right? That's what I've been doing for quite a while. Raphael, I'm not arguing with you. Um, and also, you don't know the whole story. So I would be careful with what you see. My brother, Grogu, is ENFJ. And he is a type 3, I believe, Enneagram. He's a goal setter. I mean, I mean here's the thing to remember. There's nothing inherent to be said about marijuana. People have a relationship with various things in their life. Raphael has an unhealthy relationship with negativity and toxicity. Um, I, I instead have a healthy relationship with marijuana. Which is better? That That's the sort of question you should be asking, right? It's like Raphael doesn't smoke weed. He's also incredibly negative and bitter. Um, are those two things linked? I'm not making that claim, right? It's like uh, he keeps... a attacking me for being a pothead but i've yet to hear any justification from him that suggests there's anything wrong with being a pothead that i'm somehow diminished in any meaningful way that he can articulate that in fact if i weren't a pothead i'd be notably different because i've spent plenty of time in my life not smoking any weed as well and i can tell you i'm still the same person Thank yep. you, Winston's mom. Um, I'm actually wearing earrings that Delilah gave me for Christmas. Here's some of my favorites. Thanks. The other thing is I get to see in my students other people of my same type and recognize that they're doing the same kind of attentional things as I am and that it's playing out in the same way. <laughs> so it's not really that they have memory issues. It's that they're on to something else and they're thinking, right? It, it, there's this normative quality that is implicit to function bias that says be, the way in which you differ from me that doesn't, from a third party's perspective, look to be as effective as the way I deal with shit means you're in the wrong. And I will ignore the ways in which you do things that are more effective than the ways I do things. That's just implicit in, in function bias. So it's like, you know, it, I, I think most people go through life to some extent thinking about how the other people around them are deviating from how they ideally would be or behave or talk or whatever. Because that's where the problems in life lie, is when you have problems with somebody, it's like, Okay, well, how do we understand where that conflict comes from? That's going to occupy a lot more of our attention, or how do we resolve this conflict, than things that don't have as much importance. So as a consequence, we tend to remember the uh, more important things better. I want, like... I, like, never thought myself as a victim as well. I think people should know that, like, things happened in my life, and um, I'm now stronger because of it, you know? 
Okay, so Scott Steiner, there's um, <clears throat> what we're talking about here. Then is two different kinds of data, and which we ought to, which we ought to prioritize. So what you're saying is, I've been told in a class and been shown evidence that's sort of universally resonant that marijuana causes certain kinds of brain damage. Um, <clears throat> I'm saying you get to experience somebody who's been smoking pot most of the last 35 years every time you come here. And you get to see impact. Now, mm -hmm. if for the last 35 years I was drinking as heavily as I smoked pot, I'd be dead. If I were doing anything else, any other drug, as heavily as I smoked pot, I'd be dead. So is it possible to say that, that smoking marijuana is worse for your brain than not smoking marijuana or not doing anything? Yeah. Possibly. But um, are you are you making an advocacy? <laughs> it's like, are you advocating that I stop smoking pot? The, the reality is this: I, I smoke weed and and within a frame of reference. It's not. I'm not a a. I'm not a hypothetical person. That's some sort of average person who needs to be advised about how to be, right? No, I'm not 70, Scott Steiner. I'm not 70. And what Scott Steiner is saying, no, you won't see the effects until you're 70 years old. Yeah. Well, then what the hell is the mechanism? If it doesn't matter how much of it you smoke, you still won't see the effects until you're 70 years old. Are you sure this purported correlation isn't a lot weaker than you think? I mean, that's when people start getting dementia and shit. Uh, I'd be very curious. I'd be very, very curious to see how strong that linkage is, you know, what? because otherwise the mechanism doesn't make any sense. That's called good thinking, right? Let's critique it. If in fact the mechanism were right, why wouldn't we see it occurring sooner if marijuana were linked, yeah. given the amount of marijuana being smoked, if there were a strong causal connection, why wouldn't it have that impact sooner? I mean, what if you've been forgetful all your life? Like, my grandma also used to call me Forgetful Jones from the age of, like, four. I just... I mean, Sin, that is factually absolutely false. I mean, all the data shows that since marijuana has been legalized in those states where it has, drunk driving rates have gone way down and intoxicated driving rates have gone down. Which means people who are high are not driving badly enough to get pulled over. I mean, I, it's ridiculous. It, these, these attacks on marijuana are groundless, ridiculous. And the crazy thing is you have evidence of that right in front of your face. You are spending all this time paying attention to somebody who smokes weed constantly. Mm -hmm. And you are being continually corrected significantly in significant ways and in indisputable ways by this person that you are claiming is doing something that's going to make him stupid. Even though I've been already doing it for 35 years and it hasn't made me stupid yet. You're talking to somebody who went through the 1980s anti-drug indoctrinations, who understands experientially the ontological damage of that kind of thinking. The failure to recognize that other individuals are different human beings who may have a different relationship with things than you do. To recognize that if you want to critique me for smoking pot and tell me it's bad for me or something, then I then you should invite me uh, me to critique all of your personal choices. After all, it's not relevant to you. You have no say in the matter. You have no interest in the matter. And trying to seize some sort of ground of me ontologically on whether or not this is good for me to do is incredibly arrogant and presumptuous. I mean... What I, here's the thing. Darkwing begs this. Other people tend to see it as trying to make me mad. I see it primarily as um, requiring good response. In other words, people say, when people say very wrong things, they provide an opportunity to make strong statements regarding what is correct. And it's never a bad idea to take advantage of that opportunity. Some people go, 
Yeah, but what if they're trolling you and they're just trying to provoke you? Well, if they provoke me in an interesting way enough that it's a good opportunity to make a, a bolder moral claim and win the point decisively and convey to everybody why, blah, 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 then it doesn't matter if they got their way. If they did, win, win. Chronic marijuana usage is rare. Most people are chronic marijuana smokers. It's comparing chronic smokers to chronic pot smokers. They're few and none relative to the majority of the population. I mean... I don't think that's accurate. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I, I think it is accurate. I don't think that there are... I think, I think that our availability bias heuristic makes us think more people smoke weed than do because we see people at the weed store all the time. And the weed stores are definitely very successful businesses. They get a lot of traffic. They get a lot more traffic than say a liquor store. They get a lot more traffic than say um, an auto parts store, you know? Right, well, again, as an individual, I have my own my own frame of reference, which is to say, I am never choosing between smoking pot or my default of doing nothing. My default is not doing nothing, right? My default is being a drunk and or a meth addict. It's, it's not and smoking weed and smoking cigarettes, okay? So remember, here's, here's what it looks like in the worst case scenario. I'm smoking meth, drinking alcohol, oh smoking God. weed, and smoking cigarettes. So when you talk about should Eric Eric smoke weed or smoke cigarettes, what you should say is, should Eric smoke meth, drink alcohol, smoke weed, and smoke cigarettes, or should Eric just smoke weed and cigarettes? That's the question that it should be laid out there, right? Because I'm not you. I don't start as a default that I'm not addictive. I, that I'm prone to get addicted to things. I do get addicted to things. I I am very addictive. I'm I've mastered that now in my life such that the things I use to to be a healthy human being are are minor addictions that help me to um that are sustainable over time. In other words, they don't negatively impact my life. And that includes weed and cigarettes. So it's like, is weed healthy? The question itself ignores the fact that you need that context about each individual person to answer that question. You cannot say in any way, shape, or form that weed is healthy for meow because you need to know meow's story. Is weed healthy for me? Again, if you frame the question correctly, and you say, but yeah, it is. It's so much better than the alternative, than the real alternative, not than your hypothetical world in which um, everybody um, is choosing to be addicted to things instead of the default of being addicted to nothing. That's pretend land. It's ignoring your own addictions. Everybody has their firefighters. Everybody has their managers. For me, weed and cigarettes are successful managers, which is to say they don't cause any problems. Weed and coffee for me. Uh, yeah, and the thing is, I wouldn't actually say personally that I'm um, addicted to coffee, but uh, I, when I don't have it, um, sometimes I experience problems that I'm not sure if it's attributable to not drinking coffee or not, but I'll get a headache or something. Sometimes, that yeah. I can't that make. happens to me sometimes. And then sometimes I'll have a cup of coffee and I'll feel better. I'm not sure if that's actually a link or not, if it's just in sometimes. my head. It is. That's the thing. But cigarettes Placebo. are different. I mean, cigarettes are way different. Oh, it's so nice out. We got some rain going on yeah. here. Yeah. All right. Well, the thing is, Scott Steiner, a very important thing to remember is there's a big difference between telling somebody they should stop smoking because they might get cancer or you or emphysema and telling somebody they should stop smoking pot because it's making them dumb. The latter makes general claims about 
that cascade down, whereas the former doesn't. And that's that's the big difference. It's like, if in fact you're right about the latter claim about pot making people dumb, then I am in fact, you know, you should, if you, if you want to believe that mechanism and plug in the data you have, then you should be operating on the assumption that I'm pretty stupid by now. You know? Now, granted, you didn't say pot makes you dumb. You said it affects your short-term memory when you're old. And I don't want to straw man you. But uh, it, it, it's triggery for me because I've heard so many times as a kid in the 80s that was fundamentally the message. Pot makes you dumb. And I've lived a life that invalidated that, falsified that with 100% certainty. Like, oh shit. You know, because at first, at first I was scared. I was scared that they were right. I was scared that I would get dumb. And yet I liked it. And it was a struggle, right? And then um, I've come to realize that, oh, it's not that there's something wrong with it. It's that those people were being incredibly shitty and lying to a bunch of children because they thought they knew what was best. Yeah. Like, and so it's, it's like, I don't, I don't, when people start offering their thoughts about why marijuana is bad or some of the negatives about it, my answer is if you're concerned about stuff that you don't do, and its impact on others, you should be minding your own business. I'm thinking about minding PP's business. I mean, even if you are correct that SI gets harder according to the data, it specifically messes with the working memory, short-term memory processing. One of the reasons I've explained before that I like to smoke weed is that it, it dampens down my extroverted intuition some. Uh, in the sense that, let's say it's the morning and I'm reading some news articles on Google News and I'm feeling very bouncy back and forth. And I'm not sure what I want to do. I'm just kind of like, <laughs> and then I can smoke pot and maybe settle into something. In other words, I'm less intuitively um, intuitively hmm, peripatetic. And that's a good thing for me. So in other words, what you're framing as a normative, as damage, harm, reduction, bad, is only, can only, only ought to be framed accordingly by individuals through their own experience. You're making normative something that fundamentally isn't and ought not be treated as such. Just because something impacts my cognition in a certain way doesn't mean it's reducing, harming, or whatever that cognition. It means it's impacting my existing balance of cognition in some fashion. And whether or not that impact to the existing balance is a good or bad thing is not something you can know. So even if you can point to the downside of the teeter-totter, there's an equivalent upside of the teeter-totter, and you can't actually measure impact in any meaningful way that doesn't pathologize the behavior. In other words, there's something wrong with doing that. So, you know, and this is the thing. It's, I almost titled this one, The Age of the Meta-Analyst. What does everybody seem to always need to hear? Exactly this sort of shit, right? That, okay, being right under the wrong frame of reference is not good enough. Vincent's mom, last I checked, she was in her glory. She was inside the uh, bedroom on the bed, and I had probably just woken her up. Shall I check in on? You know, it's like I had to draw the line with my clients today they wanted yeah. me to work with their kid on this paper okay so this is going to probably make a lot of people here very mad to hear this story um here's what happened 
he's doing the, he has this class that's like world religions class, and the teacher gave them these these uh, what the teacher calls case studies, which are really just handouts that frame a historical event in a certain way, and um, he's supposed to write a paper on it. Well, the first thing I did was say, okay, well, here's a paper you should write for this class. And I described a good paper that was basically a meta critique of um, of how it was, just, it was not a meta critique, just a regular critique of how religions uh, how religions I sort of self-identify in terms of their relation to the secular world. So Christianity, for example, says give give Caesar his due, um, whereas Islam says. Um, you know, where's Caesar and God? So there, there, when there are frames of reference where they say God subsumes the secular, there are frames of reference that say God and the secular have their own domains that don't conflict at all. There are frames of reference that say there is stuff that's clearly secular and stuff that's clearly sacred, and um, when they conflict, it depends. You, you you prioritize meow in situation meow and meow in situation meow. So, like for example, um, we prioritize the secular in matters of uh, criminal law, but we prioritize the sacred in matters of um, community relations. So, it's good to ostracize that person, but bad to throw them in jail would be an example of that, right? Uh, Normative frames and secular frames, because uh, basically a normative frame is an attempt to secularize a religious frame and an attempt to universalize those uh, moral indications and or obligations and or prohibitions that are that universally resonate and excise those that don't. So this is the paper that he should have written because it's the best paper to write. But of course, after some arguing, but that was going to be too, he took that, his mom made him go ask permission to write the paper I told him to do. And the teacher, of course, said no. Um, so I was mad because the mom should never have asked that teacher permission to write that paper in the first place. That's reinforcing the wrong frame of reference. But after some more discussion, I said, fine, look, because the teacher's shifting the goalposts and saying, oh, well, I really need you to be more topical to this handout here now, all of a sudden. Okay, fine. We'll do your purported case study, which is really a handout of, of arbitrary claims. Um, and we'll address it. And we'll do the least controversial one we can, which is the internment camp one. And we'll discuss the, uh, and he, he, you know, the teacher wants him to say, Buddhists in the internment camp were treated, were discriminated against by the American guards. I want him to say, um, Compare how these prisoners were treated to other the comparable prisoners in other circumstances in the same war, and you'll conclude that the secularization of American law is all that stood between them and annihilation and concentration camps, and that that secularization emerges from the Christian tradition of affording each of the things its separate realm of influence. And that's meaningful analysis of the subject matter, okay? So we worked on this paper together. I We worked on it. I helped him with get it all set up. To get any, are you this? No, not like that, like this. Blah, 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 blah. I get a call today. I'm taking that. I'm taking that. Bridge comes in and says, um, Jeffrey wants to know if he can work with you. My mom wants to know if he can work with you on that paper some more at, in half an hour or whatever. And I said, no, it's not on schedule. I'm not paying, no. So then I got up and and mom is a guest at another time, 3.30. So I said, okay, fine, whatever, let's do it. 
Well, what do I arrive at the, the session with at, to discover? He's writing the paper about uh, the paper that I told him explicitly, you know, we, you know, if you're going to write this paper, you got to argue it this way. And he, he's instead, he said, okay, well, I guess really the teacher said it was not topical what we were doing. It absolutely was topical. I mean, it was exactly about the fucking case study that the guy had the kid. How can it not be topical? It was about Buddhism and internment camps. How is that not topical? I mean, the fuck? So the teacher's making him write a paper, and he's done a fair amount of work on it after throwing away all the work we did on the Buddhism paper about how this mosque burning by Hindus someplace in India represents, basically represents an example of Islamophobia and and, 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 and. Even though the number of misdeeds committed against Hindus by Muslims vastly, vastly, vastly outnumber the number of misdeeds committed by Hindus against Muslims. And so, obviously I said, I, I was furious. Because why again? Interesting, I just thought of this right now, why again? That teacher's FI, arbitrary bullshit, is forcing this kid to violate the basic prescription of NI, which is tell the truth. I wouldn't help him with it. I just said, I can't. No. You, we've, we've done this now. This is the third time that we've addressed this issue. Uh, the first time I told you, uh, just do it, turn it in, you know, put them in a corner. If the teacher, if you've turned in the paper and the teacher has to read it and grade it, then you're in a position of power because it has to be evaluated somewhat on its merits. If he's going to critique it and give you a bad grade, he's going to have to argue justification. And now he's down exactly where you want him and he's toast because he's got no good arguments for this shit. Instead, he does the worst thing Wait, not, not his fault. His mom makes him do it, you know. But there's the worst thing an ENTP could ever possibly do. Ask permission. Number one rule in life with everybody except ESTJ dad is it's easier to seek forgiveness than permission. If you're not doing anything wrong, it will be hard to bust you for doing something without permission. If the only thing that's wrong with what you're doing is not having got, gotten permission, it's going to be really hard to bust you. Um, Grogu asks an interesting question. Uh, Eric, have you ever changed someone's mind when they have a strongly held belief? I mean, I don't, I don't think the economy of belief works that way. So in other words, I've impacted lots of people's beliefs in lots of different ways. Um, I don't think there's some sort of success criterion that says I have only been successful if by the end of a conversation, somebody who disagreed with me at the beginning articulates agreement at the end. So I'm satisfied if all they walk away with is having learned a lesson that not to make that bad argument again because it got destroyed. Then I've done good in the world. I've improved their thinking a little bit. They won't make that bad argument again. They'll maybe still make other bad arguments, but they've eliminated one bit of wrongness from themselves simply because they realize uh, every time I try to use that weapon, uh, I run the risk of getting nuclear bombed. So it's too vulnerable a weapon. You know, maybe it's a weapon that it's like, basically it's like a an all-out blitz. <laughs> you make them realize that this argument is like an all-out blitz. All the quarterback has to do is lob it over the, the blitzing 
defenders and touchdown. You got to keep some people back to play defense, right? If the quarterback reads, you got everybody coming on a full goal line blitz, you know, <laughs> then, um, then he's just going to lob it over the incoming players and it's going to be a touchdown. It, as soon as you teach somebody that that particular argument is like that, is the equivalent of that, and they stop using it, that's how you impact people's thinking. Not by changing their beliefs, by making them incur the natural consequences of being wrong in certain ways. I remember when I, whenever I got an A on a paper, um, it was because I did the research and also formulated my own opinion on it. Um, th th I'm thinking about when I was in college though. So there's, well, you know. Well, here, here's the thing I was saying to Jeffrey and Jeffrey's mom too is this, this is so contraindicative of making school work at all desirable for him. Yeah. And if school work is going to be something that's not torture, He's going to have to, in every piece of writing, attack something. Otherwise, it's torture. Yeah, that's true. If, and his mom wants me to help him, help him not attack. And I, I just, it's like, I'm not going to do that. No. So, I'm drawing away. Then she had me help him with this short story, I think. Come up with some ideas for it. Like, he's weirdly, um, I guess, like any ENTP, he's occupied with his own shit. He's got a lot of stuff ideationally going on that's unrelated to school and stuff. But um, it's like, so, and because he's an NE Dom, he's, he's happy to defer, uh, the, you know, not, not to defer, to delegate the NE to me. In those circumstances, he doesn't care about the schoolwork anyway. He's just trying to get it done. So I run a few ideas by him. He goes, ah, I'll work with that one. You know, uh, It's a time travel idea, which is basically that it involves no time travel. I mean, it's always the same thing. It's ever-changing in the sense <laughs> that she's always trying to make me interface like she does. Okay, Eric, yeah, but if we weren't going to use an action deliberation frame of reference and we were going to try to dance better to their tune, how would that look? Well, I, I refuse to do that. I'm not going to do that. If I can find a compromise, like I did with the Japan thing, right? It's like, okay, mom interfered with my initial plan because it was too controversial and got it denied by the teacher and set the precedent that everything that was going to write had to be run by the teacher first to get approval, right? And so then, sure enough, having set that precedent, the next idea, which was perfectly okay, was nevertheless rejected. It was already established the teacher could do so for arbitrary reasons. Why? Because Jeffrey's mom made that happen by sending him to ask permission in the first place. But she doesn't understand things under that frame of reference because she's an ESDJ, which is an executor. They don't have, they just don't question the frame, nor do they question the tool. In other words, they never question whether or not they ought to be interfacing, and they never question whether or not they ought to be interfacing the way they're interfacing. <laughs> that makes them difficult for me to deal with. She operates under the assumption that she is absolutely correct in her fundamental in her frame of reference. That is to say, that the way to solve the way to deal with shit is to interface. By using SI. You know, it's like so, I don't know. When I was, I, when I was little, I don't, I was always analyzing people. And I was always, like, not the happiest that, like, um, Chandler and Monica got together. Because I didn't see that as working well. And, like, now I know why. <laughs> but like I knew it like intuitively like I wasn't ha like I thought it was like a good storyline a good twist for like it added something new to the plot line and that's how it probably really would be if there was like a marriage between an ESTJ I mean I, I actually thought that relationship 
looked believable. It did. In the way it played out. It did, but I just was, I don't know. I, uh, it, I want to address what Scott Steiner says. Uh, cooking helps calm intuition, both introverted and extroverted. That is true. That's absolutely true. But there's a way to calm extroverted intuition that doesn't involve SI as well. So, um, but you're totally right, Scott Steiner. That's, that's one of the best pieces of advice you can possibly give at ENTP. Cook yourself a meal. Make yourself slow down and cook yourself a meal. It's a great, great piece of advice. For an ENTP. For, to give to an ENTP. But there's a, another way that I can get out of my extra intuition. And it's much more pleasing to me inherently and much more comfortable. But let me tell you something. After I'm done with this thought, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to put the barbecue coals on. My dad found some uh, steaks on sale at the store and bottom for me and Rachel today. So I've got some mashed potatoes over there that I'm going to put in the microwave. And I'm going to follow your advice. Um, but uh, the other way for me to get out of my extrovert intuition is to watch something that really is NI resonant. And that's a much more pleasing way for me to get out of my extrovert intuition. It'll segue into my SI uh, more comfortably for me. Um, because, uh, in other words, it requires less SE, basically. It requires less SE to get me out of my NE than does the SI stuff, the cooking a meal. But that's just me being, you know, incredibly spoiled and lazy and stuff. So what I can say about that is it's not a good thing, I guess. <laughs> but but Scott Steiner, we're good about cooking well. The core thing that you're right about is that Preparing yourself a meal rather than, say, heating up burritos makes an extroverted intuitor especially slow down and return to, their, return to their physical being in the physical world in a way that's very good for them. Um, baths also help in an SI sense. Uh, cleaning helps. Um, making lists helps. Uh, but if you want to cheat and try to avoid the S part, Watching very good, compelling anime is the most pleasant way for me to calm myself down. Mm. And it does work. It's just, it has to be really good. If I'm extrovertedly intuiting a lot, um, I won't be able to switch over to receive mode, which means I won't be able to pay attention to the anime. I keep thinking about whatever it is I'm thinking about. And I have to go rewind, rewind again and rewatch it. So the anime has got to be pretty good. If it pops enough, and it grabs my attention, and I, then it'll, it sort of like forcibly shifts me into receive mode, and I go, <sighs> and then all of a sudden my extroverted intuition is off. It, it's not. There's no slowdown. You know, when I switch to SI, it's a it's a bumpy ride back down to from any to SI. When I switch by NI, it's binary. It's like, oh, it caught my attention. Now I'm no longer extrovertedly intuitive, which is is something I had never thought before until I just said it right now. All that stuff I just said is interesting. Uh, an interesting, I guess, inference from the line of thinking you prompted there, Scott Steiner. Okay, I'm going to start the barbecue, and then I also, I'll be back here before I do this, but I'm also going to have to go get cigarettes pretty soon. So raise your old man the ship, I think, maybe while sure. I'm gone. All right, I'm going to start the barbecue.
Hmm. You know why you guys are a little uptight? You never got to have the original four loca. We did. A lot of the figures are the original four loca. You're not. They took out the cocaine back in 2011. And you may say, but Jack, my elder, what did real four loco feel like? Have you ever tried to use six cups of coffee? And then six electrocuted yourself? Have you ever fought a tiger naked? And one, have you ever drank a lot of soups after brushing your teeth? And then shot to the afterlife and didn't come back? Because we've been coming down off that high for 10 plus years. Now, good news, I have some old poor looking that I have been keeping up my ass in 2020. It's been more safe than keeping it. So maybe we can get together in the bottles of that pool, which is where you drink poor loca. We'll get a little buzz, then we'll get a little more buzz, then we'll start uncontrollably shaking. I'll play, I will follow you up to the dark. Driver's license and cry it out a little bit, and we'll emerge just one generation a generation called millennial. What's up, Gen Z? Millennial. Are you demonstrating Dark Wings Pegasus's hypothesis? What me? Yeah. <laughs> no. Can I see Rachel? Are you easily distracted? <laughs> like to be on the phone and watch TV, the other things at the same time, but on the flip, get hyper focused into things. Mm. Yeah. Yes. To all of that, I get, I am easily distracted. Uh, and, like I was, and I was just on my phone watching stuff on, on Instagram. And uh, when I'm like really into something, I get obsessed about it. So like <laughs> typology is like one thing that is like always on my mind. Um, Astrology is something that I think about a lot too, a lot less than I used to. But, uh. I think it's interesting that, that Catherine Favre's test both got me right, 784, and then said, but you're actually not a 784, you're a six. What? What? Yeah. Stop. No, it did. I took it. I took it today. It you, and it, made, it said that you were a six. What? No, no, no. I mean, it got my tri type correct. Seven, eight, four. And then it had an asterisk next to it and said um, some results that turn out to be seven, eight, four are actually a six and you can tell these people because they tend to answer it depends to everything now, the thing is of course <clears throat> there are such people who say it depends to everything but those people are called infps and it has nothing to do with an ingram i'm not that person i don't say it depends on everything and if i do say it depends i'll give you what it depends upon I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid answering the question, in other words. Uh, and if I do say, it depends too much for me to answer the question, then it actually is a bad question. It's not, it's not my being a bad question answer. It's my being a perfect question answer. So it's like, I'm more than happy to go along with your question. And I'm more than happy to work towards not having an it depends answer. But you have to ask at least a basically adequate question in order for me to go along with that, you know, there was, um, there was one question early on that was just impossible to even, I, I had no idea how one would interpret the question at all meaningfully, you know, it's, uh, so basically what she's saying there is, um, meta analysts are, I mean, the way she described it as always saying it depends is something that's actually a phenomenon of INFPs. But 
she's probably talking about like ENTPs because she doesn't like the fact that that for some of their her questions, they're just not good questions. You know, it's like uh, with the with the plates thing. I have no problem with the plates. I'm not saying it depends. I'm saying no, this is a tough call, but I think this one prioritized. I make a firm decision about it and go like that, right? But if you ask a question like, um, uh, <clears throat> when you encounter something new, do you have, do you, um, do you respond? Do you react strongly? Right? When you encounter something new, do you act strongly? Well, that is actually going to depend on the thing you encounter, right? Mm -hmm. It's not my being a dick to not answer a question like that and not be able to answer a question or say that depends. It's not my being in my feelings and unable to answer any question like an INFP. It's a bad question. It's a bad question because it says, if I encounter something new, do I react strongly? Now, the problem with that is strongly compared to what, right? Strongly compared to other people, to my perception of how other people react to, to new things. Strongly um, compared to how I react to old things. Well, it does everybody have more reaction to that which is unexpected than that which is expected? I mean, there's lots of reasons why that would be a terrible question. I'm not saying it's a question Catherine Farb asked. It's just an example of a question that's that the only correct answer to it is um, it's a bad question or it always depends, so I don't know how to answer it. I have a, I have a question. Um, what's your opinion on the fact that she considers herself to be a four seven eight? Do you think she's blowing steam up her ass, or like she actually could be? Um, I, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. I, I have no opinion about her anagram type. I have opinions more about her likely. Uh, cognitive functions type than her and Ingram type because uh, she seems she seems well one, there's one thing in particular that made me think that she was NTJ of some sort which was this fixation on the right protocols that was indicated in the first email. Like, uh, you know, there, there's a, a right way to, to test tri-type, and she doesn't want disinformation being spread by people giving wrong information about it, right? And So in other words, she's misunderstood the thing that an agram is. It's not a thing where 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 you get to say there's a correct and incorrect interpretive inter uh, interpretation of an Ingram because it's predicated on a fundamentally arbitrary, unfalsifiable claim that there are three core negative emotions. And so the whole model is, is taxonomical, not a model. So there's no right or wrong explanation. There's just different, different interpretive taxonomies. It's a different kind of thing than cognitive functions. It doesn't make it worse. But it makes her notion that her interpretation of it is the correct one, that other people, uh, de that to the extent that other people disagree with her and deviate from her interpretation, that they are leading people astray from the truth. That's ridiculous because it's not that kind of thing. I might make that claim and it's not ridiculous because what I'm talking about is that kind of thing. So in other words, she, you might go, well, you're doing exactly the same thing, Eric. Okay, well, she's saying her turtle is super fast, but it's actually a rabbit. I'm saying my turtle is super fast because it's beat all the other turtles in a race. And that's the difference, you know? Is SE inferior, insecure by giving someone a bad experience? SC fourth. Um... Are you insecure about giving someone a bad experience, Rachel? That's a really good question. How do you give someone a bad experience? By 
Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That I'm would. Very insecure about that. That would induce a bad experience. Yeah. I think INFJs are very attentive to that, whereas ENFJs think it's just sort of like an initial resistance you got to push through. Yeah. You That's know? why, like, me, like, gushing over um, uh, Zuko, like, I had to apologize. I didn't mean, like, to FE, like, the shit out of it, but, like, I really think he's a cute-looking cat. I can't help it. He's really cute. He's very handsome. That Zuko. He's so cute. <laughs> How do you give someone a bad experience at SE8 slot? Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, obviously, you could give somebody a bad experience by like punching them in the face or something, but um, I, I assume, I guess I'm just sort of assuming society is as it is uh, that, you know. Somebody's engaging with you by choice. You're not really giving them a bad experience, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I mean, now that you, now that you point I, that out, I, really I can do. think of lots of examples. I do care. But I, 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 do. <laughs> um, I do care. Like, so for instance, um, like say I were to, oh God, this is so real. This is so real. So say for instance, I were to take you on a trip to New York and like show you around. I would be fretting that if is he having a good time? Is he warm enough? Is he this? Is he that? Is the shit? Are his shoes appropriate for the walking? Like, is he okay with all the walking? Like, I, I. But see, I'm not gonna have. Um, I'm never. I would never blame you for that unless you had already overridden my objections. Okay. So, in other words, if I said. Rachel, I really think this is a bad idea to go to Mia today because of various Mia reasons. And he said, Eric, I, you know, I, this is important. We need to go. Blah, 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 blah. And then we go and I have a terrible time. Oh, I, that then, would be, then I would be that like, that would be so bad. That, I'd be like, see, next time no. we're doing it my way. Okay. No. Next time you're listening to me because no. that was shitty as fuck. No. But that's the thing. It's like, I don't, I don't. I can't conceive of that ever happening. I have to be super careful yeah, I am not to voice like that. voice objections at all because I don't want my my any sort of conditional. Well, this might be a possible objection to um, to make you think I'm actually objecting to something because I want to. I want you to be able to um, get what you want as well as what you're what you need on a tool function level, which is to say, to be able to successfully use your FE. So. Uh, thank you for explaining that. Mm -hmm. I did the caricatures when someone left the command. I can cartoon, can you? And I doodle to understand things better. In class, I doodled the teacher's notes to process. I doodled all the time. I probably doodled more than taking notes. Um, I used to draw hearts, like, you know. It, any SI doodling is very different than an ISE doodling. Mm. So I tend to doodle. Well, I picked it, I used to do something that my mom did. Every time my mom was on the phone, she drew things and she would uh they were always basically little houses little, basically oh. like lying square drawings um i used to do that when i was on the phone too i just pick them but a lot but the thing is uh when i doodle it's always it doesn't begin with a plan to draw anything in particular it begins with some random lines and then i draw other lines and then i make a little circle there and then, yeah maybe i make something into a head that kind of looks like a head that looks like a big bug guy. And oh, man, those kind of look like totally the buds of wings. And so now it looks like a big bug guy with one wing and one arm. And he's shooting a fireball now because that smudge right there could be a fireball. That's how I do. Yeah. You know? I think NI doodling is definitely, definitely more thought out. Um, but like subconscious, I guess, a little bit. I don't know. Piss, I really don't know. Piss, Piss Offerson, absolutely we do. 
And if I can just anticipate where you're going with this, what it is that we're talking about is a thing that we appeal to to establish whether a given source of action is engaged justly or unjustly. So when you're asking like, well, where do they come from? Who gave them to you? Do they exist in the natural world outside of man's institutions? The answer is they are how man manifests justice is with understanding justice in logical terms. So uh, the way to understand Lo, uh, justice in logical terms is to look to see what observationally axiomatically can be sustained as universal moral something and what can only be sustained situationally and to uh, to say that our criminal justice system fundamentally operates with a mission to be in accordance with justice as understood through whatever definitions of justice can, are most universalizable. So that, of course, since justice is always a process, never an outcome, um, when, when, as far as what we're doing going forward, right, we may have examples from the past of people being subjected to injustice or a just outcome, but those are always irrelevant to the current question. The process is what attains the justice, but the process itself needs to be in accordance with um, the mission statement, which is to attempt as much as possible to make reality match what is fundamentally morality, which is our symbolic framework that universalizes. Those aspects of the symbolic framework that logically sustain and universalize. So that's why we don't have punishment for people who don't do something if someone's drowning. If Joe's drowning and I don't do something to help him, I'm not guilty of a crime. Because for one thing, maybe I can't swim either. You know what's crazy? I had such guilt. I've actually been in a situation where a person was drowning and I didn't do anything because I didn't know what to do. And the lifesaver, the life uh, guard was like, you need to be more careful. And I was like, oh, shit. I guess I really do. Were you a little kid or something? I was a little kid. My mom, it was the first time my mom let me babysit my baby brother. And I was like, you know it would be really fun? If we go from the shallow end to the deep end. And then we could, like, you know, splash around. Not thinking that, like, the size of, a, like, a one-year-old is, like, not, you know, like... My brain didn't work like that. So he was in the water and I was like, and then the the lifeguard was like, take that baby and like you like be careful, be more careful. And I was like, right on. Yeah, don't drown the babies. Yeah, don't drown the babies. And um, so it's it's fun. Uh there's a okay, well say the lifeguard can be sued for negligence if he did nothing. Sure. In fact. I wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if a lifeguard could be held even possibly criminally negligent, but because, but that's a, 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 an affirmative duty that failed to be met that's contractually agreed to. So in other words, that there's that cop who refused to go into the school when there was a school shooting going on. I forget where it was exactly. And he just stood outside and was like, uh, should I, what should I do? <laughs> Everyone got all furious at him and he got fired. Now, should he be held criminally liable? I don't think so at all. But um, should he be held civilly liable? I, again, I don't think so at all. Should he be fired? Yes, absolutely. I think so. Because he's not doing his job, right? On the other hand, if you're talking about a lifeguard whose job it is explicitly, it is much more explicitly defined. If someone's drowning and you see them drowning, you jump in there and save them. And your job is to pay attention so that is, there's never an instance in which someone drowns, but you were looking over there the whole time and they drown and you look back and they're already drowned, right? So that's explicitly your job and it's very clearly defined. The policeman's job is not to run into gunfire and save people. It might happen, but it's not in his job description, right? So 
that is a matter in which he has to exercise his discretion as to how to go about do, doing something in that circumstance. And instead of exercising his discretion to do something purposeful, he exercised his discretion to prevent anything bad from happening to him and do nothing. So in that instance, we as a people need to make, use our discretion to say, you are not, you failed to do your job in a way you had plenty of opportunities to find a, to maximally, find a way to do your job that was maximally safe for you, but still at the same time do it, right? I think I was, um, I think I was six when it happened. It was one. Or he might not have even been one, actually. He might have even been turning one. Um, I think he was turning one. So I was six. I had no freaking clue how to babysit. I, and the, I, 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 well, I mean, was, you shouldn't I, have been tasked with it. I shouldn't have. I, I really shouldn't that, have. Why blame you? Why not blame the adults who tasked you with that job? Um, so, uh, I'm an Raphael asked, well, where does logic come from? So logic is, uh, it comes from the statement connective and, or if then, or if and only if. And yeah, that's that, where logic comes from. And the thing to remember is when any, whenever anybody is attempting to critique logic as somehow either arbitrary not worthy of, of, not worthy to use as a justification for things or something like that. Make sure that person uses none of the following words: and, or, if then, if and only if, and not. If they use any of those words, then, um, in order for for me to afford any meaning to those words, other than blah, 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 then they're acknowledging that they too have to use logic and are subject to its constraints. Otherwise they wouldn't play that game, right? If you want to speak, then you have to, you have to use logic because you're accountable for things being true. And being true means both valid and not obviously observationally inconsistent. I didn't swim away. I didn't get help. I was right in front of the lifeguard, and that's why she picked him out of there. Like, um, it's embarrassing, you know? Like, I was like, I didn't know what the fuck to do. I was a kid. I, I loved swimming, and I was a swimmer. I just thought that he would swim. I, <laughs> like, I, like a six-year-old kid would, you know? I, I had no clue. And the lifeguard scolded me, and I would never, ever, like, I never, ever did that again. I, I, it, I, I don't know. It worked, I guess. So, Raphael asks, okay, so these words were not established out of logic? I mean, and is, represents our capacity to make a claim that two distinct things are both so. Or establishes our ability to make the claim that one of two things is true or both, but not neither. I knew someone who was tossed into a pool to learn. He didn't learn. He was afraid, like, after that. He learned to fear being tossed into a pool. Yeah. Um, so in other words, the, it's, the question that Raphael is asking is, is an example of a category error because of course logic is in one of the ways in which people pay attention. It's a way of paying attention that ensures that other people's, uh, that other people are considered equal people rather than just, uh, tools or animals. So when Raphael critiques logic, he's saying, I don't like not being able to treat other people like tools or animals because when I'm held accountable for my words, then I have to be saying things that resonate with other people too. that aren't just about what I want and what I feel. And I don't like that, but you know, that's called growing up, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying. 
I mean, Raphael, you do all the time. What are you talking about? You're constantly critiquing logic. You're constantly critiquing everything I say. And when, and when your critique fails, you critique the frame of reference that rightness and wrongness exist, basically. It happens time and time again. So what are you saying? Oh, I see. I, I wasn't, I wasn't like, um, no, you're right, uh, Winston's mom. Uh, my instincts, honestly, I am a freezer with I run, wait, fight, flight, or freeze. I'm a freezer. I'm like a deer in headlights. It, it's really embarrassing. So, like, when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm in my manic phase and I'm like, like, just, you know, tossing things and expressing my SE. Um, I think all intuitives are freezers. What's that? I think all intuitives are freezers. Do you? Because if something immediately happens in the physical world, we want to intuitively <laughs> understand. Yeah. Now, yeah. Here, here's the thing. It is the case as well that, that intuitives have the capacity to use the physical aspects of things like introverted intuition. So, for example, when I'm driving and I just can tell that this guy doesn't see me up there and even though he doesn't have his blinker on, he's going to come up into me and I'm about right here on his bumper and I decided to pull back and go like this instead. And, in fact, he does that thing and I do it all right the last second so I don't have a problem. That's introverted intuition kicking SE into gear. And all of a sudden, I, you know, without making any thinking, talking, or deliberation or anything have saved myself from a big problem. Just magically somehow. That's yeah. NI. That's why NI seems magic because the whole thing's done before you realize you did it and it was, if you hadn't, it would have been a disaster. <laughs> That's insane. I actually had one of those moments um, too. Uh, I was driving on the highway. I was, it was totally my fault. Really in my element, you know, I was fucking around on a rainy day. And the slabs were like, Rachel, you need to like calm the fuck down. So what happened was I was speeding and it was raining. And um the dumb you know like when some people slow down to like turn into the the off ramp. Well, this person did that. So, like, was stepping on the brake too early, and I was like, oh, fuck. So, SE, like, right into gear. Like, check my mirror. I was, you know, safe space, went over, blah, like, yeah. all in one, like, swoop. Okay, so, Raphael, let me clarify. The, the, the way in which I mean treating people like animals or tools is very simple. People can talk, and people can understand. Tools are not expected to talk and are you you don't expect you have to ever answer a tool or respond to what it says. You never expect to have to answer an argument from an animal. You're just talking at them. You're not talking with them. So logic is how we transition from talking at people to talking with them. Point of time, I totally want to play. Do I look like my grandma or my uncle? But I don't have pictures of either of them, so I can't play that game. But one day, when I get that, when I get pictures of my grandma and my uncle, we'll play. Who does Rachel look like? Her uncle or her grand or her grandma? I think I look like. I don't know. I think I look like my uncle Paul. It's fucking weird. But a nurse said that I looked exactly like my grandma McCurgan once, so it's debatable. Um, I also have another question for you guys. What is your, what are your top three emojis used on your phone? Put them up on the screen, please. Yep, Uncle Polly. My dad used to joke about it. Nice, Freddy Forgiato. 
Mine was cat, cat eye smiley, cat eye hearts. Um, let's see. Let's see, let's see. Cat eye hearts, purple heart, red heart, now clappy. Um, oh, look at you guys. How fun. Everyone's like so cheerful. That's so nice. Nice, Bendy Anya. I like the inquisitive face. Oliver Linehan. <laughs> I like that you have the side. I, I respect anyone who still uses the side uh, face crying emoji. A lot of people do not use that anymore. Same with you, Morridge, using the crying laughing one. It's good times. Uncle Paul is what my nieces and nephews call their Uncle Paul. Oh, really? Is that your... You don't use emojis? I didn't think you would, actually, Winston's mom. I had a feeling you might not. That's totally fine. Oh, it's the only way you can find me, too. It's all good. Yeah, that is roll, rolling on the floor, laughing. I don't know why. Well, she goes down on you and I see it all. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love you, you said. Thank you. Wow, Raphael. Do we design our Jesus system with these rights? Um, for intrinsic or instrumental purposes. Uh, well, and would you have your baby? <laughs> it's a very interesting question. I mean, yeah, maybe, really. of course. I mean, the thing is, of course, <coughs> every individual who played a part in normalizing that legally had their own justification, right? So in other words, there's no answer to that question that doesn't make a, make a mistake of affording an intention to, to a decision made by a group. Each of the individuals who agreed with it had their own reasons for agreeing with it. I have a question. Mm -hmm. well, I can't seem to answer it myself for some reason. I guess SI back a slot. Um, what position do I usually wake up in? Um, if you're still, am I going on, you're still really all the way asleep, you're almost always on your side, one of the sides. Ah. Um, but we're going later in the morning and you're sort of awake, it'll be on your back. Oh, that's good to know. I'm glad I sleep on my side. When you do sleep on your back, that's when you make little noises. <laughs> My nose is broken, so I snore, um, and I realized that, like... How did you break your nose? Um, dumb, stupid. I was... Dumb, stupid night. I don't know if you want to... Don't know. ask. <laughs> it was a dumb, stupid-ass night. Fucking hated that night. Um, you want to ask, don't tell? 
Sometimes no, I don't mind idea. telling you. No, but sometimes that's a good some, look. Yeah, right. Yeah, sometimes that's a good idea in a relationship. Right? There's plenty of things where it it was not in, it did not involve physical. I was drunk and I face palm. I just like boom like that. That's how you know. That's how you know. Like you should fucking that alcohol is not good for you. But anyway, whatever. Um, I face planted. Uh, on the sidewalk and I broke my nose and so it, I really like like I I really do have trouble like breathing out of my nose so um, uh, I'm a mouth breather nice. SCP is the most vulgar I would say MDPs are the most vulgar Mm -hmm. SCPs, um, to be the most vulgar, you have to make a lot more jokes than SCPs do. Grogu, I was so drunk, I didn't even know what happened. So I I got myself up and I was like, ugh. And um, then someone was like, oh, you have like blood on your face? And I'm like, ugh. What happened? I ran into a... Uh, bathroom. When was that? How old were you? I was probably 20. This is 2011. Yeah. So 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So 26. Mm -hmm. That's a long time ago. I was dating an ESFP and he was um, and my friends from college were in Raleigh. And I was like so stoked because I was like, how, like. It was between Billy and New York? Yeah. Um, okay, I am out of cigarettes. Uh -huh. uh, I'm going to go first. Okay, cool. I've got steaks on. I'm going to flip them. I'm going to go get cigarettes. I'll come back. Yeah. These ones won't take as long because they're going to start off frozen. My mother did that. Not sure it broke, but it looked terrible. She gets drunk a lot. Um, like, definitely not one of my proudest moments. That was like, okay, so what happened was my friends from Pennsylvania from college were in Raleigh at the same time that I was. So we talked on Facebook and we were like, yeah, I was like, I would love to show you around town. Like, this will be really fun. I haven't seen you in so long. And he was like there with his, his buddy for a hockey game. And I was like, you can meet my boyfriend. So I took it as good, a, a good time to get out of the house. Cause like at the time, Zach and I, the ESFP weren't, doing much we weren't like going out and Zach instead of like being socially appropriate was like buying shots for girls and then the girls rejecting those shots and then us like taking the shots instead it was like a crazy night and like I'll be gone in five seconds uh, <laughs> Hold ESFPs, on. man. You're welcome to tell all this story in a second. I will be out the door. My urine is done. I am almost done with it. <laughs> it's like, um, no matter, it, like, it doesn't exactly cause me any discomfort, but there's just some sort of general rule that I have that I suspect some guys have and some I'm guys sorry. don't. No, 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 Rachel, listen, I'm not critiquing you at all, okay? It seems to apply to me, but doesn't apply to other people, which is um, it makes me uncomfortable to listen to. Uh, I, I think it's expert, maybe an expert in intuition thing. Whenever I listen to you talk about uh, things like that from your past, I, I extra rudely intuit in extra un, unsaid details that might be whether they were inferred or not. You know? So anyway, I got to go get cigarettes. I'm going to flip the steak. I'll be back in about seven or eight minutes. Okay. I'm glad I don't drink. 
too, Winston's mom. Um, I have to remind myself to breathe too. Uh, Winston's mom. I wonder if that's like an NI thing, forgetting to breathe. Um, I saw Frank James's, right? Frank James's most recent post. What was it called? The, the 16 personalities at a party. And it, he said INFJ is sitting like basically on their phone, like taking quizzes. That was me. I was always the introvert, like on my phone. I am so attached to my phone. Oh, with the shot story. Okay, so like with Zach, like I felt like I was like powerless. Like I felt like I had to fit in to like be his cool or whatever. I didn't know. I was so young. Um so he, so he's trying to act cool. And he's like, I'm going to, to like, to my friends, he's like, I'm going to get you guys laid. And I'm like, oh, my God, no, this is, like, the worst idea ever. All I wanted to do was, like, chill and, like, show my friends, like, some bars around the area. And, like, like Zach just, like, couldn't be chill. And he would buy like he would see groups of girls and he'd be like okay we're gonna like buy a round of, of shots for those girls and I was like what are you two doing if 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 one of them like my one of my friends like likes one of the girls maybe buy her a drink you know and show her that way but don't buy a whole group of people shots that's crazy and so Zach would buy these tons of shots and we would be getting them back because the girls would be rejecting them. So we took like, I don't even know how many shots in a row. I think like seven shots in a row. It was crazy. I was like basically dared to. I didn't want, honestly, I didn't want to. But it was like me and this guy who hadn't been out in the, of the house in a while and my friend, Andrew, from college. And... um like, Andrew and I were always, like, just friends. Um, he likes hockey, and I like hockey. And, like, it was just cool that, like, he happened to be in the same place. And I really did want to show him, like, around Raleigh. But instead, we get so drunk that, like, I don't know how I couldn't stand it anymore. And I face-planted, and I broke my the bridge of my nose. <clears throat> so, like, like, I get... I don't know, I get like snotty, you know. So piss pisses off for sin. It was like a oh, and the ESFP. So like um I literally was like so done with Zach. Like I had my I had face planted and he did not care at all. He did not try to like help me at all like he was being such a bad boyfriend like he was always such a bad boyfriend to me i was such i tried so hard like in that relationship like i so like i broke up with billy and then i basically go out with total opposite of billy this esfp dude who like at the same time that I wanted to have a good time, he was looking to have a good time. So we found like people to like smoke weed with. And then things were fine. And then he lost his job. And once, once Zach lost his job, he lost like all motivation in life. And like, it just was a mess. And I wasn't sleeping. I was overworking. I wasn't sleeping. And that's when I had my first manic episode. So, do they? So, supervisors are type ESFP. What, what is uh, your type duels?
I, I, th I remember throwing my purse at him. Like, it's just like dating him was so, so like volatile. Like, I, and I didn't understand, like, he was never like fully into me, you know, like, like, I felt like I was very manipulated in that relationship. It didn't last long at all because I couldn't stand his bullshit. Um, and him not contributing to the rent was like really pissing me off. I was like, you know, here I am like working overtime. And I also take when I'm off of work, I'm also with your family, like working on projects and you don't even like, you know, like you don't even do anything for me. Like I was like basically drinking, I was like eating ketchup and like, like, like dollar menu stuff. Thank God I had dollars at least, but um, it was really bad. I dated him because he was the exact opposite of the guy that I was dating before him. So when I was with um, Billy, we were long distance and then I moved in together with him and our living styles did not match. He didn't like that I smoked weed and I was looking for friends. Um, in Raleigh, uh, who did. And so Zach, uh, worked at the same restaurant that I did. And he was like totally different. Like, like Billy was, is straight edge. He's, um, a hardworking guy, like very like good hearted dude. And I like, for some reason, like we were clashing so much, like he was working, um, the opposite hours of me and we were never we never saw each other and then he tried to like kind of like father me a little bit with like drinking and it just like living together was a different relationship from when we like were long distance together we were long distance really good but living together we weren't and um I was looking for someone who was looking for a good time. And I got that with Zach. It got to a point where I was like, I only have two options right now. I need to either go back to New York or I don't, I, I just thought the only option that I had was to go back to New York. And Zach, he told me, he was like, no, let's do this together. I know we can do this together. He's like, I just got a job at Dick's. And we'll be making a lot of money because I'm going to be working in the like bow area. It's my specialty. And they, you know, they gave me a good um, salary and uh, you can work as much as you want at the restaurant. Uh, but then he lost the job at Dick's um, illegally, actually. And he felt so defeated that um, he just like didn't feel like motivated to do anything he would just like masturbate all day and like drink beer and smoke weed like our weed like i would come home sometimes and he would like fin finish the whole thing and i'd be like what the fuck like like leave me some too you know i'm like working my ass off this is my money that's going towards the weed like stupid ass like it was but see at the time i couldn't say i i was I was so like manipulated and naive that I didn't know that like this stuff was wrong. I'm thinking I can make this better. Let me just like be more like this or like, you know, like people go through hard times, but the truth is that I should have just went back to New York, but instead I stayed and it was like, I like a very memorable moment. Um, and I, you know, I beat myself up a lot, uh, when I came home because I, I ended up going back to New York after Raleigh and, uh, you know, I like atoned for the things that happened. Um, I never did anything physical with Zach, but I had one foot out the door definitely with Billy and it made me feel sad because he didn't deserve that. So, um, like, I, like, really did a lot of atonement um, over the past, like, 10 years. 
Um, so, you know, and I recognized that I, I didn't deal with things the right way and um, that I was naive and that I was manipulated and that I didn't handle things with Billy the right way. Like even, even if it was like, I don't know. So I did a lot of soul searching and, uh, you know, so, uh, things in Raleigh were really turbulent. I'm very honest about things, you know. I've made mistakes in my life, but I know that some of the things that I've dealt with uh, over the past 10 years has not been kosher. ESFP and ENFP are very likable. They're very charming. Um, my second roommate, one of my second roommates was uh, ESFP and she introduced me to a lot of new people, so. Hmm. Dark Wayne Peck just has it right. When we're young, when we are young, it's easy to be drawn to the bad boys slash girls and struggle to hold on to what's actually good for us and how we will best grow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I went through a lot of, like, life, life lessons, but, um, it was just, like, it was, it was so, um, yeah, it was so enticing, I guess. I thought that. I was like, I was like, oh, I don't know. I wasn't happy, like, for a lot of time in that relationship. It was really, really um, not good for my health. I feel bad, like. Thanks, Jewel. Yeah, I'm happy I'm here, too. I'm real, really lucky. I've had some bad times, but I had some really good times, too. Like, I'm not really a victim, you know? Like, hi. Hi. I'm so glad you're back. Thanks. It is cold, cold, cold out there. Mm. Oh, is everybody ready for my Simpsons trivia question? Which Simpsons character? It's kind of a tricky question, so the answer may be stated in the form of a relation rather than a name, if you want. What I mean by that is, let's say the answer were Marge, it's not, and you didn't know her name, you could say Lisa's mom. All right? Here's a question. Who said... The following thing in The Simpsons. We've tried nothing, man, and we're all out of ideas. Of course, obviously, uh, you could Google it and find the answer. But if you don't want to cheat, then... Nope, it wasn't Homer. Was it Mr. Burns? Nope, it wasn't Mr. Burns. Ned Flanders? Nope, wasn't Ned Flanders. Nope, not the bus driver did. It was, in fact, 
Anybody want any other guesses before I say? Wait, say it again. We've tried nothing, man, and we're all out of ideas. Tried nothing, man, and we're all out of ideas. With the babbity ba 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 ba. Otto is my next guest. Well, the answer is it's a very obscure question. It's Ned Flanders' father. Oh, close. And it's, well, you just Ms. saw it the Bob. other day. You, you and I just um, watched it the other day, though, Rachel. So. And that's why. <laughs> that's that. There's I that SI that. for you. There's that eight slot SI. Oh, it's um, terrible. Uh, yeah. It's the episode where, where Ned Flanders gets cured of his ODD. <laughs> By the Minnesota Spankecological Spank Protocol, which involves uh, a guy in a lab coat spanking Ned Flanders for six straight months. <laughs> yeah, the flashback to his childhood. Right, exactly. Nice memory, Raphael Averroes. And his parents are beatniks, right? Yeah. And the doctor's like, well, that needs this plan. And, um, oh, no way, man. We can't do that. And then the wife says, like, yeah, man. We're not down with the man, man. Like that, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. And then, and then the doctor says, ah, blah, blah, blah. and that's when Ned Flanders' dad says, you got to help us, man. We've tried nothing. And we're all out of ideas. <laughs> Yeah, he had one of those berets and one of the, a little goatee. He's a bohemian. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Ross. Um, it's not a frog shirt, though. I mean, it is a frog shirt, but it's actually R I B E T, Rebe. We've, we've had this discussion already. This is a French guy's last name who started a school in Los Angeles. Rebe. There's a school in Los Angeles called Rebe Academy. And. It was started back in like 1980 or something, maybe 78 or something like that, by this French dude named, his last name was Rebe. And it is not a hockey school, Legends Fall. It's, <laughs> there, well, there are it many really things you can say about Rebe Academy, but it's a hockey school is not one of them. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, shit. I don't know. It's 648. It's 840. There's a basketball game we want. I want to watch oh. tonight. It starts at 830. What is it? I'm nervous. Dun, 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 da, 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 da. It's the semifinals of the Pac-12 tournament. USC going up against the number 20 ranked Colorado Buffaloes in a showdown to meet the winner of the other semifinal game, which is almost certainly going to be Oregon. So... Tonight, I can't do the drums and the singing part at the same time. The drums go bum 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 and then the uh, the mouth the tune part the, the, the marching band plays goes and then they segue into I'm going to do a lot of USC games. <laughs> My dad's a huge USC fan. I am too, but um, uh, it was sort of imprinted on me by my sensor family rather than naturally occurring, I guess. Let's see. What's going on here? 
Eric, why do you think PewDiePie is an INFP? His entire business is stylistic preference. Okay, alternative motif. I, I buy that. I mean, I'd buy ISFP, uh, I guess. Um, he seems a little bit talkative for an ISFP. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I just put it this way, ulterior motif. I have spent way too little time watching PewDiePie to have a very strong opinion about it either way. I just, I've watched like one or two videos of his just for the purpose of typing him. And it's high police episode, which means I didn't really care uh, whether I got it right or not. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have any opinion about it, really. It really seems like I have a strong opinion because I say in type police, whatever. But you got to remember the old model of type police, which I moved away from, I think, at this point. But was that that I was sergeant host Eric in those episodes and I wasn't regular Eric. And I was playing a character and that character was kind of a dick, you know. But I've come to understand that it didn't really, it didn't really work uh, for me ethically, regardless, because other people didn't have the same ethical frame of reference, and I had to deal with their actual impacts rather than rather than consistency with some mapping thing, you know. Okay, fine. I mean. Well, Raphael, again, see, this is what I'm talking about, not treating me like a human being, right? That's not what I said. I didn't say I didn't care about the thing I was doing. I said I cared about a certain specific aspect of the thing I was doing because I didn't think it was relevant to the thing I was doing particularly. And I made that clear on multiple occasions within those videos as well. Now, instead of treating me like a human being, what have you done? You pretended I said something else. That's what I mean by you don't you think of other people as tools or animals that they don't have that they don't enjoy the same capacity as you to convey meaning and expect their meaning to be heard. I gotta check the stakes. We'll have an intermission. Yes, Raphael, we will. You're going to watch this intermission and you're going to like it. Okay? You're going to sit here, you're going to listen to this shit, and you're going to say how good it is. And if you don't have anything good, then you're going to shit your pie hole. Okay, Raphael? Party person's run off to the west right now. For God's sake, your pie hole's always running around. Party beverage to the west right now. Party knows the game she plays. Your play, be the best. Pound your chest, shake the rust. Trust the roof to stay concrete enough. Our true intuitive pure of hard work of feet. The peerage of the party run off to the east, run off to the east, run off to the east again. Party peerage to the west, right now. Everybody knows the game she plays. You know what, Rachel? I think I think that Raphael's a potster. Ooh, potster! God damn it, we were right. promised a plane! <laughs> Bodies in the street. Tony and a black recruit. Not overburdened health care, sir. But you see, it's been underburdened. Gee, that's just COVID. So exaggerated, we have been lied to, fooled, misguided, directed to the wrong side. Your cherry picking art is not going to work. 
You don't know the stats, your data gathering methodologies are crap. Listen here, if you only test the sickest, what you think is gonna be the trick? Trick, 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 South African, the guy who comes up to her and says, Is that for her? When it's clearly cashmere. It's wrong. Yeah, it's wrong. R O N A L T R O N C H O N C H O N S O N. Rock, no, Ron Chon Chon song. It's the same. Everywhere he goes, Ronald knows that those he meets, you <laughs> know they hate to see him gone. He's the only son of Donald, Ron Chon Chon Song. Ronald's not the day of no wrong, so Donald will never treat Ronald. Don't ask to Ronald. Ronald, Ron Chon Chon Song. Donald, Ron Chon Chon Song. Ron Chon Chon Song. Who is the man who comes up to me? Who is the man who comes up to me? Who is the man who comes up to me? It's over with the pillow, casually. Wrong. I thought my question you wouldn't want to get pinned down. Given that your argument is neither relevant nor sound, your certainty has faded. You've begun making an eight error. Can you make a song? Based on just a little loop, right about it goes. I wonder if you heard me at all. You're me up did you really think I wasn't gonna answer the call and everybody thinks they're immune for some people work buttons for punishment too been down before I have been up the line I can tell you from experience, it's a best momentary repast. <coughs> but that reasoning just don't fly. <laughs> You're guilty of some sort of intellectual treason, and I'm putting you to death. Fuck yeah, get in the box, bitch. You're not gonna 
music. Ain't no sound in this movie.
gave up long ago. Was sometimes bad, but bad was all I'd ever know. Since sad was all I did, I'd only mope and pout. Till I met a man named Kid who showed me how to whisper shout. I'm rich, I'm the best, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm rich. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm rich. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm rich. I've just been sad. I gave up long ago. I'm the greatest. Was sometimes bad, but bad was all I'd ever know. I'm the greatest. Since sad was all I did, I'd only hope and how. I'm the best. Till I met a man named Kid who showed me how to whisper shout. I'm rich. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm rich. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. This is for you, darling. So sit next you. to that. And then. <laughs> saw the uh, lobby lights flashing you know what that means intervention is coming to an end and I'm sure you're currently making your way back to your seats inside the opera house where we uh, film all these episodes of talking with century mm. naturally like every good organization we hold our meetings in an opera house Mm. Mm -hmm. It's called Popularity's Law. And the more important something is, the more likely it is to include opera in it.
and do a fishing live stream. What's a fishing live stream? Fishing live stream. That would require internet where I'm fishing. That'll be a bit of a a TE undertaking, I think. Well, I have tried streaming before. Um, you know, from like a public place, the Dodger Stadium. The internet is just too spotty. Yeah. But everyone's doing the same thing. You know, they're yeah. all on their phones using the Wi Fi. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that. Um, the internet we currently have is the best internet I've ever had. Yeah, me too. By a large margin. Mm hmm Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I can remember, like, being in New York and, like, going spotty on us or whatever when we were talking. This has been the, the best internet I've ever had as well. It's so nice. Mm -hmm. It's crisp and clear as summer moonshine on a winter's night. <sighs> well, so I hope you're all mukbanging with us. I'm assuming that people watch mukbang because they're themselves eating as well at the same time. Is that why people watch it? Because they want somebody to eat with? Maybe. Maybe. So. Yeah. Do you have any dinner? Take this piece of advice. Hey, now's a good chance to heat yourself up something. Yeah. Take dinner with us. Enjoy the evening. Enjoy. You know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to share some of my Perrier with you. Ooh. That is very nice. I want to say I'm sorry for hurting FI. I don't mean to. You didn't do that cool. <laughs> um, I think of things that your mom would finger wag me about. So. <laughs> well. That's like. She used to do that to me sometimes. I, I'm aware intellectually that um, the only one who's been a problem here is me, not you. It's just recounting a story from the past or who you are. Um, not appropriate for me to try to say make your past be something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. That'd be some magical thinking. Well, it's silly. Uh, I think it's maybe an SI4 thing. I'm not sure. It's like... Yeah. Or maybe front stack. Well, yeah, just like being threatened by your significant other's past. Like, I don't get the sense that you've ever particularly worried about somebody from my past being a threat or things about my past being a problem. Um... I think instead you think of the universal reality somehow um, potentially being a threat or something like that, you know, like, yeah, but, um, you know, if, if you're in a certain place, certain position, you, you potentially one could conceive of a situation where somebody would have to exercise a lot of uh, self-discipline to uh, avoid a lot of temptation or something like that. Well, it's really just fundamentally not true because I'm not, tempted by that. I never let it get there to that spot where it would get to be like whatever. I'm not giving off open vibes or interested vibes or or even even non-oblivious vibes. So my first response to some girl trying to send me hey there big boy <laughs> kind of vibes is to basically pretend it didn't happen. You know? Just kind of 
Well, I mean, it's not even like I'm pretending. It's more like the data seems not worth my attention, I guess. It's just sort of like, I don't, okay, well, I'm listening for actual things people saying, not, not silly things like, hey, there, big boy, or whatever. Yeah. It's true. You really, I mean. I just think, okay, or maybe it's girls for him with me. Yeah, you're such a great partner. I mean, I really could sing your praises. Like, you, you just, I don't know, you're just a great. I greatly appreciate your FE discretion. I probably wouldn't be able to be with an ENFJ, you know? Because. The thing is, I actually value her FI for me, which I can see all the time, you know. <laughs> I really yeah. feel like you love me a lot, you know. I feel like you love me a lot, too, and that's okay. why I feel like open to actually sharing my FI. Yeah, I think you're no longer nearly as much worried about NI defeating SI because you've accrued a lot more SI um, SI weight. So in other words, you're not an ENFJ. Eventually, no. your personal experience starts to define your NI. Yes, it does. But um, you just continue to land on deaf NI ears. Mm -hmm. I continually get positive feedback. I mean, not only like, like, like I see how functional your family is too, as well. Like how you were raised and how your parents interacted with each other as well. Like it's very admirable. I do admire like the relationship that you have with Delilah and the relationship that your parents have with each other and with you. Thanks, darling. Yeah, I'm you're welcome. So I appreciate the fact that Rachel values that rather than resents it or feels competitive about it. Because we're on the same page about our respective stories. And our respective stories is not a story that makes her family particularly look good, right? So it's pretty important to be on the same page about that story because, um, you know, you push against somebody's family at your peril in a relationship. Like, um, when Kimberly were pushed against my family like that, that's where I drew the line, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, you know what? Hmm. See, the thing is, like, but the, the difference being, of course, she was trying to change my history. Um, and so that, in that regard, that's why it's all me, my bad, regarding you and your storytelling about your SI and shit. I, it's not, I don't have any ownership over your past. But um, I mean, Kimberly tried to retell my stories about my past in ways that um. made them more toxic, right? Basically, in which, no, your parents weren't really like that. Or, no, it wasn't really, you're, you're, you're painting a rosy picture or something that was actually a lot darker or something. But no, it actually wasn't a lot darker. And I'm not going to allow you to rewrite my history. Um, yeah. and, uh, and so it's like the reason that Rachel and I don't have a problem about our respective understandings of our own family and the other person's family is because they aren't inconsistent with what we perceive to be true in general. Yeah. It's really, I mean. 
Xavier Black, when you think back about the relationship now, do you feel like um, regret, like you wished you'd done meow, 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 or do you feel relief, like that was a pain in the ass, or do you feel um, um, sorrow, like I miss my beloved husband, or do you feel uh, um, liberated, like now I can do whatever I want, or what? Talk to us about your feelings. We want to know about your feelings. Mm -hmm. Isn't it weird how even though it's just us sitting here chatting with everybody, different moments of this live stream will seem much louder or more quiet. Even though you can't hear them at all. Mm -mm. So how could how could I have a louder or more quiet argument with somebody who you can't even hear at all? <laughs> well, it's obviously all me who's getting louder and more quiet. Right? <laughs> So it, it, you can kind of you can kind of get a lot of information about an ENTP. My reading your words is no different than if you were saying them in person. You know, mm -hmm. I treat it exactly the same. There's no the meanings are the same, so I respond the same. And the only difference between, I guess, somebody could have tone that conveyed meaning orally, but um. I'm assuming it's not one of those kind of tone issues, then. Hey, et cetera, et cetera. Big M Ruiz, hello. I don't go there. I do not like to go there. I don't go there. I think that is... Uh, boldly. I mean... Neither of us go there, right? Yeah, no. Nah. We, mm -hmm. we do both talk about past relationships sometimes, yeah. but I don't think either of us have ever told a sex story. Yeah. Um, I mean, the closest we get to that would be my general stories about how, how you know, Kimberly psychologically made it, the game she played to make it impossible for me to have sex, basically. Um, or you know, make it very difficult, I guess. Yeah, and like how like I was lied to about someone who had HPV. Like those are sexual, but they're I know related to sex, but yeah, they're not. But they're they're not, not descriptions of the yeah, act occurring like, in any instance. That's the key thing. That's the key distinction. There shouldn't be. I should never describe a sex act as up with somebody else to Rachel, because. That's concretizing um, a reality that's uncomfortable in a way that makes it more experiential. You know, I, I want to like caress my my um, food baby right now, the way that Meghan Markle was caressing her baby belly during the interview with Oprah. I mean, seriously, like, let's just fall right on the money is true. It's like, you know, you know what I mean? We didn't have problems is when I was just so frustrated, I probably just pushed me down on the bed, you know? It's like, God, why are you so difficult all the time, you know? Um... Because the way I want to transition from not having sex to having sex is a little, convers little playful conversation, mm -hmm. little lying around, and just sort of settling in with each other. And it's no, it's not a, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, a sort of pretend lion antelope thing, really. It's mm -hmm. more 
you know, th that kind of level of lion antelopiness is is e expressed in in like words, 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 not in actual action. It's no. there's still that quality to it, but it's like it's a story, a story to be told, not uh, whereas. The other is the exact opposite. It's stop talking. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you're absolutely right, Legends Fall. I made it impossible for us. We were so incompatible. So this this kind of sexual th reality that I'm talking about now is one that's all, a pretty safe one to talk about around your new partner with whom you have perfect sexual compatibility. And, and she already knew about it, too. She watched the channel then. Yeah. She heard me talk about how sexually incompatible we were back then while we were going out. Well, I and that woman and I were were oil and oil and water or oil um, and vinegar or yeah, oil, you know, oil and water oil and water. They, yeah. We were um, yeah. we were just uh, we were ammonia and bleach. That's what we were. That woman and I were ammonia and bleach. Okay. We made a poison gas. Um. Because it, simply because when when one talks about past encounters, it causes your partner to picture your, the person they love with somebody else. That's that's my justification yeah. for it. I don't know if this is the universal one or not, but I don't like to picture her with somebody else. I don't, and I don't like to picture him with someone else either. I want to fully. I'm going to totally confess, like. When I when I came here after uh, being in New York for a little while, I was really nervous because um, I knew that uh, Eric had like a pretty healthy sex life with his ex Candace and I was like you know they were married for a while and together for a while like am I going to be able to like uphold that kind of <laughs> like I didn't I it's so ridiculous too because it's like if you've seen pictures of my ex-wife <laughs> and okay I, what I wish I could have done for Rachel which would have really um probably solved this right away <laughs> is I wish I could have sort of real time made manifest in in two mirrors next to each other Rachel naked and my ex-wife naked <laughs> and then break any possible insecurities Rachel ever would have had would have disappeared because you know it's like um, you know, Ferrari. Uh, we might get it to run someday. <laughs> we might get this, this, this old Yugo to run someday. Uh, it, it was just night and day, right? I guess. I, no offense to my ex-wife. I don't mean to be insulting. At all. No, That's not, I don't mean to be mean at all. What I'm just saying, um, it's it was insane, which her insecurity. It, it was. was I. But I, I did feel that it was uh, that I could talk to you about it, and it was important that I talked to you about it because um, feelings of jealousy are not good to keep inside, in my opinion. <sighs> For me, I can't. I don't like to keep things uh, from Eric. You right. Will, you know, important things anyway. You know, there's something important we're gonna have to talk about, Rachel. What's that? I don't want to do it, but oh no! According to Raphael, according to a guy Raphael talked to, only anal is okay with God, and the vagina is a no-no. Oh really? <sighs> That's frustrating. I mean, that is very frustrating. Because, as you know, I've never even considered it's empty trying to put my penis into your butt. Oh, God, thank you. And the reason oh. that's the case is because of something that should be extremely obvious oh. to everybody, and oh. I'm not quite sure why this doesn't just sort of ring loud and clear for everybody. I need a bong or a That's bong. where poop comes from. <laughs> yeah. You know, that oh, that oh. is where poop comes from. Why would you want to bad. put your personal own, very own personal penis Oh, into some have... someplace where there's poop. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. 
It baffles me. It seems so obvious that the answer to <laughs> to funny. anybody talking about anal sex is, but there's poop in there. Yeah. You know, it's... And it's... Even, even if there's not yeah. actual pieces of poop in there, there's still poop residue in there. I have you to know? be a little bit graphic, too. Like, <laughs> oh, God, this doesn't cool. happen. No, no. This, like, in porn, it's not the same thing. Like, it's not just like, oh, just slip it in. Oh, oh so good. Like, no. Like, people don't understand. Like, well, it's not the same. Like, it's not the same thing. <laughs> That's like a like porn is for fantasy. I'm done. I just said I'm done. 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 It's love pain. I love pain. Um, where are my the cigarette pack that I already opened? It's like I made a title in a live stream. Are you kidding? How the hell did that happen? Oh, it's right there. It's oh. too late out here in this one. I imagine having a live stream on um, which uh, Rachel regales us with stories of times she took it up the butt. No fucking way! <laughs> I think it's disgusting too. I'm joking. Oh. I don't obviously oh, don't want no. to hear anything I, like that. Uh, Listen, that's the whole point. Is This is why it's difficult to talk about past sexual partners. Is because, you know, it makes it makes both partners extrovertedly into it. It makes me, at least, go, I do too. okay, well, what see. what kind of things can I imagine and infer and, and possibilize and stuff like that? And I don't want to think about it. I don't want shit. your... I just don't want to, think to go just, run wild. Let's just meow right now. The meow the conversation topic. Um. So, uh, well, <laughs> it seems to make more sense <coughs> that men would like it <coughs> because men have a prostate, but. <coughs> You know, I should also say that <coughs> my butt is just as thoroughly uninvolved in the sexual process, my butthole, and inside of there, as hers is. It's not like it's one way where, you know, well, my own poop's okay, but hers isn't. It goes both ways. It's absolutely reciprocal burden. Both of our buttholes and inside of there are not involved it's, in the equation at all. No. The only way you could even possibly, I didn't really want to touch it even, would it be in the shower possibly if I have to clean her? I just, you know, no, I, it, yeah. no, I'm okay with no. Right. <laughs> That's where I draw the line. Sorry. Hey, no need to apologize. We're on the same page. <laughs> There's two perfectly serviceable holes that don't have poop in them. You know, it's, 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 it, that's the other thing. It's not like there's not redundancy right. here. Okay? It's, it's not like there aren't two perfectly good clean holes to use. It, you, why choose the dirty one? I don't like SE stuff that that is too, too like SI ignoring, I guess. It's like anal bleaching. Just grossness in general. Like, I mean, Piss Piss Dofferson, the answer to that is no. What? what okay, well, the answer to that is um, the only way uh, I'd ever want my partner to tell me something like that is if I was getting a heads up ahead of time of them knowing I'm going to find out about it anyway. Uh, but if, in fact, it was, it's the case that... <sighs> Um, that my partner is confident I'd never find out, then I don't want to hear about it, of course. And I don't want to, I don't even want the subject to come up because I don't want to have to be able to intuit things either. I'm so, confused. No, it's just, it's, let's just not even go into the topic. So, the point is, um, yeah. I like to, uh, I, I prefer to assume what I want to be the case and operate in a state of ignorance. Than uh, 
and, and, and also avoid instances where either the person's going to lie to me or I'm gonna, there's going to be, it's going to be in the person's interest to lie to me or <clears throat> uh, also circumstances in which um, I never want to hear this come back. You asked the question. I never want to hear that comeback because that comeback wins. Then I've just ordered myself a plate of shit that I had to sit with on my table in front of me and I can't do anything about it. After all, I asked the question. It's just a mind. Feeling. So I'm very cautious about that shit. I don't want to do that to myself. I don't want to go down that path. It's like it's not relevant to anything. It's not. But the past in general. And, uh, but, in a sense that, I mean, well, there's the, as I was talking to Leaf Trimmer about the other day, the I think the definitive kind of response to that question is Chasing Amy. If you've ever seen the movie Chasing Amy, you'll see that the only alternative to what I'm saying is what happens to the main character at the end of that movie. I forget what happens. Um, he loses her. He loses her and he regrets prioritizing something that was purely a map issue when his experience oh, yes. and the potential of the relationship and so forth was, uh, was, um, what are you saying? Mexican? I'm confused too. Are you talking about something else? Mexican. Oh, 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 I get it. You're getting a new poppy. No, no he's not saying that. He's saying, uh, can't wait for her cats, but not cats, you know. I think he's saying about you as far as I can tell. But Winston's mom was saying, Mexican, how are you and your new puppy doing? Have you found teaching him lots of new things? Oh, I think that's what Maxi Kemp was. Oh my God! Yeah, that I, is so it true. It makes more sense. I you know it does, but that is so crazily, uh, easily misinterpreted, yeah. and it's in like, um, I was just like, <laughs> what is he saying? Yeah. Because the weird thing is that kind of thing, saying that kind of thing, um. You know, there's lots of different ways that people could try to be like, uh, your girlfriend looks hot, can't wait to get on her. That would just, you just go like, whatever, right? But if somebody says, comes in out of the blue and says, Rachel looks pretty good today. Getting her in 10 days. Can't wait for her pussy. Counting every day. He, he, he. Like, wait, is there some sort of plan here? Oh, I uh, you know? yeah. um, Of course, that's not what you said at all. And it's really indicative of the importance of context because your 737 first comment is unrelated to everything else you said. Yes. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's shocking that that, that that naturally occurred. It is shocking. That you actually said without meaning to convey <laughs> anything, Rachel looks pretty good today. Getting her in 10 days. Can't wait for her pussy. <laughs> And you didn't mean anything by it. No. That that, that, that <laughs> actually happened is, is some sort of miracle. <laughs> it's some sort of word miracle. Word, you know? It is word miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and no, there's nothing going on there. <laughs> <laughs> German Shepherd. Oh, they're adorable and they're so good. You'll have fun training your German Shepherd. They are very smart. All over line hand, no. No way. It's the territory that's wrong, okay? The territory needs to change. If my map says it's supposed to be meow, then that lake needs to turn into a swamp. And that mountain needs to turn into a hill. And that desert needs to turn into a lush, verdant green area. I just keep on getting convinced that ESCP and ISFJ belong together. All that, 
I know, like, part of that, like, Essie pushing was, like, uh, her borderline personality, but I think ISFJs are, can be like that. No, I, I just got, I'm sorry, Rachel. I am just consumed by the amazingness of this phenomenon because, of course, if you asked me yesterday, come up with a scenario in which somebody says to you, Rachel's looking pretty good today. Get in there in 10 days. Can't wait for her pussy. Counting the days, he, he, he. That that was, I would say that I wouldn't at least time that person out, right? At the very least, time that person out. Mm -hmm. And also uh, launch into some sort of, what do you mean, getting her in 10 days? What are you talking about? Is, do you, is there, do you, have you been talking to this guy? Is something going on here? You know, mm -hmm. It's like um, that... Um, then that you could say that and not only not get not get banned, but not get timed out, not even have the comments removed. I would say I, I don't think I can come up with any scenario in which somebody could say those things. It you mean without anything in between them? Yeah, but nothing in between. Just two direct comments. Uh Rachel looking pretty good today. <clears throat> Getting her in 10 days. Can't wait for her pussy. Counting the days he <laughs> and I a scenario Imagine. where I don't at least remove the comment, not even time, not time out, not remove, not ban. Even with really good extroverted intuition, I'd have to struggle to come up with a scenario in which when that might happen. But the, the mechanism is even though they come right in succession with each other, one of them is totally unrelated to the other ones. That's the phenomenon. Yeah, yeah exactly. Legends fall. That's why I, I really am fascinated by the combination of ESTP, ISFJ. Um, especially now, knowing that my sister is ISFJ, I really feel like an ESTP will ground her a lot. And, you know, I think INFJs. They what they mostly don't want is uh, to feel unsafe at all, and so there are there are aspects in which SD can it plays with that safety thing as a sexual mechanic rather than just a power dynamic as a sexual mechanic, and uh, and I don't think INFJs like that. But it's just, I think that that's not to invalidate the possibility of an SC Dom rocking an INFJ's world or whatever. It's just that uh, I think that the SC Dom has to execute the extroverted sensing very well. Well, Legends Fall says is right. I think it's similar to NI Dom's liking to receive the experience that NE gives. It's just metaphysical instead of physical. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, 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 my experience with Rachel has been. Uh, I think both of us sort of um, saying all the right things at first because we finally had somebody who understood how to be on the same page and the, the words you said mattered a lot. For, this is true for both ENTPs and INFJs. The words a person say, says matter a lot. Yeah. They and, really do. And it's very important that statements get resolved. You know, it's like uh, if there's some words that have been said and it's not clear what the takeaway from those is, then it needs to be clarified. And so early on, I noted Rachel would often – bring that over here, please. Um, that Rachel would often uh, say thank you for clarifying. And I would also say thank you for clarifying. And then we started talking early on about how how nice it was to be with somebody who who understood the importance of a proactive clarification policy rather than um, allowing things to remain unclear if it's, if it's uncertain. I can't do it. It drives me crazy. I feel like, I, I don't know. It's just so natural for me to like merge with you in more than one way more than just metaphysical it's very important um i mean i think uh in general 
probably Rachel has to has more work to do in convincing me that I'm actually what she wants in the SE area. <laughs> no, no, let's just listen. Okay, I'm not <laughs> than um, the other way around. In other words, um, our, our respective relationships with extroverted sensing allow her to have a a conscious engagement with it, whereas mine remains largely unconscious. So true. It's hard for me to have pay close pay conscious attention to the objectivity of something like that or whatever you might want to call it, the reality of it, or to understand if if SE is working for the other person on a map level because it's such an experiential <laughs> thing, you know. And so I ha I look for cues that, in that I can rely upon for mapping and stuff. And that, that includes physical cues and also words that are said, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is um, it's harder for me, ultimately, I think, to believe that I'm an ideal sexual partner for her than it is for her to believe she's an ideal sexual partner for me. I think you're an ideal partner. I know you do. Okay. Probably. You've made that very clear to me. <laughs> I can't help it sometimes. <laughs> you, you, I just look at you from is, uh, afar and I'm like, he's so handsome. I, but, like, but what I'm saying is that's just basically a slot extroverted sensing. It's uh, insecure and it's um, it doesn't like to be judged mm -hmm. and it doesn't like to and I don't like things framed in that fashion in general. It, it, but although at the same time Got a very good relationship with extrovert sensing in a lot of ways when it comes to my own life. And I have a very bad relationship with expert sensing when it comes to other person, other people putting expectations on me with extroverted sensing. And I said to Rachel the other day about her introverted sensing, her attitude about ace flat and my attitude about ace flat is the same, same thing. It is. Just, look, <laughs> this is my small pond. I agree. If it were a lake, there'd be no problem with you fishing over there and you doing whatever over there, whatever. But this is my small pond. It's the only pond I have. It's not very big. It's just big enough to support me. And I don't need you coming over here and telling me and interfering with my pond at all. Okay? Because there's lots of lakes and you have your own ponds or whatever. But this pond is in perfect balance right now. It just, it's very, it's a small pond, but um, it served exactly what I need to get out of it. And what I don't need from you <clears throat> is telling me how to improve my pond, change my pond, or whatever. This is me and my pond are getting along just fine. And what you expect from lakes and rivers and oceans, you're not gonna get out of my pond. So just shut up, go away. Uh Winston's mom did does uh Kirsty say that they're a good match? Um ISFJ ESTP. I don't know. I don't know the literature. I mean, Socionics says it's supposed to be duality, but I, Desert INTJ is saying he doesn't think that ENFP is a good match for INTJ. Now, mm. what we're saying is duality for for sensor, uh, duality for judges, um, and mirage for perceivers. And um, INTJ, Desert INTJ is saying ENFP is my mirage type, but and I'm a perceiver, and they are too, but I don't think it works. So the thing is, uh, INTJs, sociologists would say you should get with ESFP. Uh, but I have a question for you, Desert INTJ. Do you think ESFP would work better? Oh, oh, my bad. Sorry. Sorry for attributing backwards. Grogu said that Desert INTJ is defending the ENFP relationship. Ah. So I'm disagreeing with Grogu and agreeing with Desert INTJ. The thing is, I, um, I, I think, Grogu, that your options as an INTJ are basically ENFP and ESFP. And of the two, ENFP is definitely better for INTJ. I I think only ISTJ can handle ESFP. Yes. I, I completely agree. I have agreed even before um, Eric really, like, well, not even before. But once we made the conclusion that, like, both physical types made the it just like made sense to me. I, well, I mean, we have Cameron who's got an ASFP girlfriend. Now she doesn't come yeah. around us at all. No, um, we never see her, but mm -hmm. um, I know her from way back when, 
And also, uh, um, sometimes I'll hear her talking to Cameron on the phone and Cameron will tell the stories about her and stuff. And, you know, well, I mean, how's his love life? I'm sure it's fine. I, I never hear him complain about no. any, any sex things. It seems like they probably have a very good sex life, but, um, uh, the things he complains about make me want to go over there and slap her sometimes, you know, like, God, you are not, not good to this wonderful person. You know, I just, I don't like the way ESFPs presume a lot of, a lot of, yeah. Um, they, like she is, she gets on his bus, his chops for smoking weed. I really don't like that. Uh. You know? And her reasoning is that she doesn't like it. Well, it's like, um, the SCPs are control minds to commitment. Uh, the ISFJ wants stability. They want to know what's planned. So I really don't know if your sister is flexible, huh? Uh, so, so you're saying Kiersey says no? They're not a good pair. I here's the thing. I, I want to answer this ISTJ question here. Are, are they pretty private about their love? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, generally, well, they're private about their sex life, more or less. Um, but uh, I, this is my guess about ISTJs. My guess is that they are very, from what I've just generally heard of of Cameron, that they've got quite an appetite. Uh, despite their mild-mannered demeanor, and also that uh, they're probably very passionate and also considerate uh, lovers, is my guess. But I've never been with an ISTJ, so I don't know. For sure. Just my guess. Oh, did I watch The Mandalorian? No, I haven't gotten Disney Plus yet. I'm currently watching a show called uh, High Rise Invasion. Thanks, Aisha. Yes, High Rise Invasion. It's actually pretty, I think it's pretty cool. Okay, Rachel, I mean, Aisha, after you say, Rachel, you look beautiful, <laughs> you're supposed to say, like what Maxie Kemp did, that you can't wait for her pussy. <laughs> <clears throat> That's what happened last time somebody came in and said that. But he didn't mean it, though. That's the hilarious thing. You missed it. You weren't here. It was hilarious. You, should, I, I, you know what? I guess you had to be there. I shouldn't even try to tell the story. But it was absolutely spectacular. He didn't mean anything by it. Thanks, Aisha. That's so nice. <laughs> um, okay. I want to wrap this up uh, in the next five minutes because um, – I have a basketball game that I and I think probably Rachel too wants to watch, right? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, and then also, I I need a transition period of thirty minutes. See, yeah, like I. That's why I feel like ESTP would be good for my sister because um, she tends to overwork herself. She tends to overdo things, like. Um, like for instance, with her apartment, um, and moving to Europe, she moved to Europe and got citizenship, but still had a lease in New York. So right now she's in New York. I just feel like even if she had an ESTP to do these things with, she, it would just be, everything would go much like smoother. I can't do, sing it and do the dance at the same time. But um, it's it's a weird dance because it pauses, right? And then it comes back over and pauses. And Yeah, he does pause. Da dee dee doom pa pum pum. De coma sada doom 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 pum pum pum. I think the ISFG would need. Thick skin, it's so. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Then I don't know. 
I wanted to answer Oliver Linehan's question from from 1997, oh, cool. which is, Eric, what's the difference between SI? Listener it's Oliver question, Linehan man. writes in from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Casey, what's the difference between SI fourth and eighth? They seem shitty in different ways and less shitty in other ways, but I haven't figured out how to articulate it. Great question, Oliver. And we'll be back with the answer after these messages. Here on America's Top 40 with Casey Kasem. How's my Casey Kasem imitation? Pretty mediocre? Well, you know, it's been a while since I've heard him, you know. What's the difference between fourth and eighth? Uh, basically... It's like um, Rachel expects to be responsible for all her own SI and not responsible for anybody else's at all. Ugh. Whereas I expect to be responsible for my own SI and I also expect that somebody else will be responsible for some of my SI. Uh -huh. So in that regard, Rachel doesn't meet that. I suck right? at that. But similarly with me and SE, I don't really meet her SE needs either. But most importantly is um, it's a minor, it's a, it's, it's the thing, it's the thing you have to give up to get things right. Yeah. In other words, it's like any other alternative that lets you keep that is worse. And this is substantially better than all the other alternatives. And oh my God. part of the reason why it's, is the best is because it makes the best possible trade offs. I've never been, and that's in other words, trading away that is the best possible trade off, yeah. and so you can't really yeah. lament the the cost. It's like, you can't go, man, we got that for a really great deal, but I sure do wish we didn't have to. I wish we right. hadn't had to spend the money. Well, I mean, if you hadn't spent the money, you wouldn't have gotten a really good deal, so it's kind of silly to say. I wish we would have gotten this really good deal without having to spend the money. It's just saying, well, I wish we would have not had to pay for it at all, gotten it for free, or or just things fall from the sky when we want them. You know, it's like it's meaningless. Yeah, I feel really guilty um, about my A slot SI because, like, okay, like before, I was looking at our toaster and I was like, damn, like if we had bagels I would just like pop them in and like make them for him like it just it's just like it's just a sore spot but the the good thing is that eighth and fourth is very similar um and the closer that we get to each other the the more we see it in each other how they kind of like it kind of goes back and forth like, uh, my SI will be shitty, and then yours will... I, I don't know. Well, one quick guide to telling the difference between INFP and INFJ is you ask them um, <laughs> questions like, um, what's more important to you, uh, uh, justice or authenticity? Justice. Okay. So, point is, INFP will hum and haw and maybe answer the question, and most likely say it depends. According to Catherine Favre, that means they're type six counterphobic. But um, if that is in fact the measure of them being type six counterphobic, then her typing of me as type six counterphobic is wrong because I'm not actually like that. I'm something that might look similar to that. Somebody who's not TI maybe, or is somebody who's an interface type, not a deliberation type, which I suspect Catherine Favre is, although I don't know. For sure. Uh, okay. So, in other words, you just have to ask them some questions, and INFJs give you straightforward answers like that, generally, unless you're asking a question that's a particularly undetermined spot for them. Yeah. Whereas INFPs, they don't like clear, distinctive answers because they're six slot NI countervalued. Mm -hmm. um, I get tripped up on like, I'm being the wind beneath my wings. No, I'm 
Because you are the wind beneath my wings. I always want to be the wind beneath your wings. You know what else you are? What? You're Osamio lady. <gasps> oh my gosh, that's such a high compliment. Osamio lady. Oh. <laughs> And you're my man. Oh my gosh. That is such a high compliment. I don't even know what to do with that. Thank you so much. I've never been so happy in a relationship, guys. INFJs, ENTPs are true for each other. Yes, um, I do believe that age has to do with it. I think maturity level does play in. But I, I seriously have never been so happy in a relationship. Um, well, Joe, would you say that this relationship is like the Bette Midler at a cabaret audition? Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, I'd go even one step higher. It's like a two-person team combo of Bette and Liza at a cabaret <laughs> audition oh against gosh. a bunch of scrubs. Can we like put Barbara Streisand in there too? <laughs> she's there. She's she's just there to sing background <laughs> for the two for for uh, Liza and Bet as a as a audition just to make their experience more pleasant. She's not actually <laughs> auditioning herself. Afterwards, they all go out for tea. <clears throat> what are you gonna do when Catherine Favre sends goons to your house? <laughs> the Enneagram goons are here. <laughs> We're all type eight. <laughs> okay, well, good for you, type eights. I don't think the Catherine Fobber is going to send an Enneagram goon to no. my house. You know, she's probably going to just do some sort of ontological assault. Next, next symposium she has, she's going to say, See, this is why I hate counterphobic sixes. <laughs> You know, that that's that's Catherine's next symposium. You know, she'll, she's gonna have a little rant mid symposium <coughs> about how much she hates counterphobic sexes. I hope because they just don't get it. They don't get what's important. Not being so so yeah, smarty pants all the time. Ow! You, <laughs> you should be able to type your puppy uh, by. Five or six weeks. Before that, it's a little sketchy. Mm -hmm. At five or six weeks, puppy type means usually start to get pretty, pretty reliable. Yeah. Pretty reliable. Thank you, Blue Glue. Um, how did we meet? We went. We met through. Uh, Match.com. <laughs> we met through Match.com. A gaggle of angry. Ace. I think we need a different group name for that. That should be a. Uh, uh, a fist shake. A fist shake of angry eights. That sounds really good. It's a good group name for Yeah, it for is. Eights. Like, you know, eights are fine. There's nothing. I have eight in my... Can I say try? Can I say try type? <laughs> yeah, you can say the word. Yeah, I, was, I was thinking, I was talking about Enneagram triads for now. In my in my Enneagram stack. I mean, you can say you're an Enneagram stack, Enneagram right? Enneagram stack. It's a three, I have eight. three thing stack. See, I... um. I fight differently than like Eric does. It's a little bit easier for, cause like uh, I get individualistic before I put my foot down, just kind of backwards. All right. Um, Screw you, I'm going home. And you never get mad unless they actually follow you home. Yeah. All right. No, no, no. <laughs> it, screw you, I'm going home. And then like, Going on social media and being like, "You suck," like that fucking sucked. Hey, you people I just hung out with. <laughs> yeah. By the way, <laughs> now that I'm home, I've had a chance to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Fuck off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. One hundred percent. Oh my gosh, it's it's. I'm happy to be a seven though. Like, I really do feel blessed. Um. And I don't think that there are that many, like, I wouldn't be surprised if there's an over-representation of sevens in the United States of America, but I don't think there's that many, um, I haven't come across many sevens myself. Well, 
You know what, Damon? I actually have a recommendation for you. I, I found a great test that can help identify your name type. You should try Catherine Proverbs test. I tried it this morning, oh. and it got me right. 784. Although it did put an asterisk after it, saying, I showed a symbol of a, of a, um, a counter probe six. Now, here's how she... I, I've since intuited what her pattern of answers is that she uses to put that asterisk. Here's the pattern of answers. If you have more than two answers in the fill in the blank questions that aren't on her list of, of normal answers, then you get that thing right there. No. That's what I've intuited. Well, I don't, I, I actually, okay, so I, I've done my own, before meeting Eric, I did my own um, stack for the Enneagram. And um, I did it on Simple, simple Minds. It comes out really good, actually. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good test, I'd say. I mean, but I was wrong. Uh, let me tell you, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. C.S. Joseph's made some really terrible typing before. But Max Kemp says C.S. Joseph types his own cat as an ESFJ. C.S. Joseph's cat is clearly not an ESFJ. I've met C.S. Joseph's cat. I've made love to C.S. Joseph's cat. We were together for six years as a couple, me and C.S. Joseph's cat. And I can tell you for sure, that cat is an ISFP. I get it. I don't know what this counter six, counterphobic six is. This is, it's like mind boggling to me. I don't know why she even has yeah. it. No, my theory is <clears throat> she's, She's made it so if you put in answers in those fill in the blanks that aren't on her list of normal answers, then you get qualified as a counterphobic six, which is her way of saying you're too NP. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I mean made love to a cat, I mean I made in a uh, metaphysical sense the emotion of love fall on the cat, which just is mostly by me saying. Oh, what a good cat you are and petting oh it is. So. goodness, so it, easy to do. It doesn't her. involve any sexual intercourse. Your no, mind's in the gutter. Petting. Your mind is in the gutter. Um, yes. Uh, do you think that my dad is a six? I think my dad is a six. Yeah. <laughs> right? He's a good... Oh, wait, no, I, your dad, I'm not sure about that. Let me, uh, let me think about it. He bites his nails. He's pretty funny. My dad can, can be. He loves to show off. Like he's like the happy clown. You know what I mean? Like or a happy slash sad clown. Like he could be a very sad clown sometimes too. I don't know. Well, what I'm saying is, all her line hand, she doesn't have a way of distinguishing between. She doesn't have a way of saying that answer is weird. So her her workaround of that. It's to include a complete list of normal answers. Anything that's not on that list is considered weird. And it's considered refusing to answer the question mm -hmm. and therefore indicative of counterphobic sex. But mm -hmm. she's completely fucking wrong about this idea that people who reject the limited frame of her test are denied whatever tri-type they are and instead rendered as counterphobic sex. It's silly. It's unwarranted. It makes no sense. And it undermines everything else she's saying. And it's primarily done because she doesn't like NPs. That's my theory. That's what I've intuited about all of this. Even, though, test. even though most, I mean. So all of her line in, all you have to do is put down an answer that's not on the list. If she says, what's your favorite color? And you put down um, forest green, your, uh, you are now count for <laughs> six. <laughs> that is so weird. I suspect you have to I put down two of them. So I suspect you have to put two of them down that don't match your answers. It's just my guess. It could be three. Uh, they, and then you get mm -hmm. asterisked. It's basically uh, her saying, you didn't take the test right. I used to, um, she she goes into her tri-type. I guess she holds forums and stuff. 
on them. And whoa, 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 price of a thousand dollars. You too can. Me crazy, crazy, crazy. You too can attend a six hour uh, symposium. No, 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 no. It, 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 it. So, um, I used to fall asleep to her recounting what a four, seven, eight tri type is like because I wanted to get to know myself better. She has some, I mean, she does have insight. It's not like she hasn't studied this stuff. It's just like. Right. I, I'm not disputing that she's, I'm not even disputing that she's the authority on the matter. I would agree by and large that if you're going to point to somebody who's, who has more claim to authoritative, uh, speaking from an authoritative position, who refers to say that she does. She's obviously put a lot of work into her site, yeah. her tests, all that right. stuff. In other words, she has a singular frame. All of her work is devoted towards this one mm -hmm. thing, right? So I would call her an authority on the matter. But the problem is um, she wants to both be an authority and not undergo scrutiny. So she can't. she's not going to be able to stay an authority unless she wants to be engaged meaningfully about her frame of reference. Hmm. But she always wants to be in the position of the expert lecturing everybody. Yeah. Now, I might position myself as such as well, except unlike her, I'm constantly answering critiques. Whereas she's holding symposiums that cost $1,000 where she stands up on stage and tells everybody else what to think. I mean, the thing is, there's nothing wrong with being a teacher and charging money for teaching what you know. So I don't object to that inherently. The problem is what she knows, quote unquote, has not been adequately. It's not market ready because it hasn't gone through the TI testing it needs to go through. It's only gone through her own frame of reference. She's not done any meta framework because she's some kind of analyst, probably. Um, blue glue, like... Um, no, you knowing you is real, you or others knowing you is real, you. I don't understand. I'm not, I don't follow that. Um, I do I understand that question. I think it's an interesting question, too. Um, am I is the is the me that I know the real me, or is the uh, me that you know the real me? Uh, well. So the answer to that is, um, if, if you're asking in terms of who better answers a question objectively about me, then it's specifically dependent on which type of question is being asked. So if, if, um, if the question is, obviously the question is, how do others perceive me? Then others would be a better person to answer that than me. If the question is, how do I, um, how do I perceive my own ability level at an objectively measurable skill? Let's say, how do you perceive yourself as a volleyball player? And I answer the question, I perceive myself as the best volleyball player in the world. And then we play a game of volleyball and I get my ass whooped by every single other person on the court. Then it's very clear that. I'm not the best volleyball player in the world and that I was full of shit, right? Well, let's say I make the claim that um, this is the saddest I've ever been. Um, there's no way to falsify that. Even if I've known you your whole life, I'd say, no, you were sadder back then. And I say, well, I may have appeared that way to you, but you know, I know my own emotional state and I'm a lot older now, so the sadness is a lot deeper and more complex. And yeah, this is the saddest I've ever been. You really can't argue against it, right? There's nothing you can say. Because that's wholly subjective data. It's about an individual's feelings and their own perceptions of how they felt in the past. It's impossible for you to win that argument because of the nature of the thing. So the question of who's the better judge of the real you is entirely dependent on what your statements are describing. If your statements are describing subjective data, then you are the better judge of the real you. If your statements are describing objective data, then others are probably a better judge of the real you. However, others too are subject to their own subjectivity. In other words, 
if somebody doesn't like me, then they're not going to objectively judge questions about me. They're going to judge them in a way that make me look bad. If somebody likes me a lot, then they too are subject to bias and they might be evaluating me in a more positive way than I actually am. So it's, it's a complicated question to answer. Probably the answer to it is also influenced by, um, by your own level of your own relationship with introverted feeling. If it's your tool function, then you're going to be very bad at self-evaluation um, and objective evaluation in general. Like you're going to be very bad at, at recognizing whether something oh, good. I'm so glad. was dance scrutiny overall. What, what are you glad about? That PB's inside eating. Oh. I was like, oh, it's too cold for her to be waiting for me. Okay, so I want to get back to um, what Winston's mom's ass. I actually. You want to go back to Winston's mom's ass? <laughs> I didn't know you were you were taking a break from it. Well, you know, I, <laughs> it's on my mind. All right, um, well, Winston's mom, bend over. Rachel wants to get back to your ass. No, go ahead. no, 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 no. Oh, I, I know, baby. Go ahead. Whatever We've had saying. so much butt conversation That's tonight. I don't think Okay, fine. Enough comedy jokes. Go ahead, Rachel. No, I um, I think I actually do kind of hope he finds an INTJ. Um, because who? My dad. Oh, you hope he finds an INTJ chick. Chick. Um, that's a tough one to find, huh? Yeah. Like. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did Siberian snow leopards. Oh wow, well, there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. So I mean, Winston's <laughs> mom. I don't know. Like, I'm not a. I'm not opposed to like. You know. He's he is dating someone right now. I don't know. I don't know much about her, uh, except that she's a librarian, and they haven't really seen each other in what seems like over a month because her son, her daughter is getting married and she doesn't want anyone to get COVID. So they haven't seen each other in like over a month. So he's like, we're together, but we're like not together. Cause. Well, I mean, she also had that emergency at the library when, <laughs> when all the cards had fallen out and nobody else remembered the Dewey Decimal System. I don't know what that is. You had to go down there and, and help everybody do a death swap. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So there was that occasion, of course, too. That was a much less covered in the news crisis in New York. Uh, there was the COVID crisis, sure. But there was also the uh, the spilling of the card catalog at the library. She had to put in long, long hours doing death all the books back. Okay, um, yeah, he's an INF, ENFP. Yeah, ENFP. 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 I, I gotta split oh, we gotta because get I want to have a little bit of time to to transition before we go in for the game. It starts at 8.30. Probably actually starts at 8.35, you know, so. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing is, Blue Glue, it's framed actually in, in terms of the language usage in the sense that um, you're saying there's only one you. Well, uh, an individual expresses attentional processes across time. So in other words, the the individual is defined as something, is correctly defined as something that is a, an agent executing processes across time uh, rather than reduced to some other kind of object. I do get SJ vibes from her. I, I really don't know. We've been, he <coughs> said that he wants to do a Zoom with her, but they haven't seen each other, so. Um, so, uh, what was it? Oh, ESTPs are lucky because um, there's a lot of ISFJs. Yeah. You know, some types are a lot luckier than others. Yep. If you're an ENFP dude, you're unlucky. You have to try to find an INTJ chick where you're pretty rare. If you're an ENTP dude, you're unlucky too in general. Mm -hmm. But if you're an ENTP dude with a cognitive functions channel, <laughs> no problem. See, that's, you know, that's the no difference. Problem. Yeah. I was able to find my mm -hmm. INFJ right here. Who knew? I didn't even. We didn't even know that I was INFJ. I know. I, I got other things you the ENFJ. Yay! So. Anywho. Uh, 
I'll talk to y'all later. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese. If you do, then get down on your knees and beg forgiveness of the Lord of cheese, the mighty Lord above. Um, I do agree that 9-11 was an inside job, but not that COVID is an aristocratic manipulation. Um, oh, Tim Bullard in a little bit. So, I'm not angry by your statements. Uh, if I were ending the stream right now, I'd say this is an excellent opportunity to talk once again about, about how to evaluate things on their merits and that one of the problems that exists in the world is that there's a lot of broken clocks out there. And they're right about one thing and wrong about everything else. They're right about that. You know, it's like, and so they go, but I'm right about this. So I must be, and you go, well, yes, you are right about that. But you're wrong about this because if you use the wrong process, you'll still sometimes get the right answer. I have corruption blindness. <laughs> <laughs> I have corruption immunity. I'm uncorruptible. I will concede that about corruption. All right. See y'all later. Don't forget to plant cheese.